for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. All right, it looks like we are live. I've been looking forward to this one all week long. This is going to be a lot of fun. It's one of my favorite topics to not only debate, but sit back and watch a debate on. So as you guys know, we are debating the Genesis flood tonight. So it's good to see everybody here. Yes, we're going to have a question and answer period as well. So please make sure you're tagging me with your questions. And of course, I'll, I'll save them and we'll get to as many as we can. We've got Nephilim Free and Derek Barnes here with us tonight. Both no strangers to debates. Uh, Derek Barnes was just here a couple weeks ago debating Ken Hovind himself. Neff was here a couple weeks ago as well debating this very same topic with David Neff. So this is going to be a lot of fun. Real quick before I go over the actual format and structure though. As usual, I'm going to hand it over to the debaters just to give a one-minute introduction of themselves, maybe what they're doing over at their channel, anything that they'd like to uh, tell us as a way to break the ice. So why don't we start with uh, Derek. Uh, thanks so much for giving us your time tonight and being here again. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you enough for uh, you know, showing up and uh, doing this thing with me and uh yeah, look, just a little something uh, about me. I'm a, a master student. You probably heard, uh, seen me before, so full time student. So uh, I'm trying to put more content out there. So I'm, a, I'm a, slowly but surely, and especially with the help of Sandy for Truth. You know, he he's definitely been uh, uh, doing a lot to get me in front of people. So I definitely appreciate Sandy for Truth always. And uh, yeah, so I'm just ready. You know, I'm just awesome. Ready. <laughs> awesome. Great intro. Yeah, I, I love having you on the channel. And like we said before we went live, I appreciate your willingness to do these dialogues and always keeping it cordial and respectful, guys. So this is going to be a good, memorable, cordial, respectful debate. Neff, thanks again for being here. Always a pleasure. How you doing tonight? I'm doing okay. Uh, I'm, I have a YouTube channel. Nephilim Free is my screen name. Uh, I've been doing creation apologetics for about 12 going on 13 years now. Well, 13 going on 14. And uh, it's uh, it's my favorite hobby. It's what I love the most. And uh, I, I hope that it uh, serves the Lord in some way. Amen. Amen. This one is going to be a lot of fun. Looks like people are excited in the chat. We've had people camping out all day, so this is going to be good. Uh, once again, guys, tag me with your questions. I'm going to briefly go over the format for the night. We're going to start off with 12 minute openings. Uh, it's going to be, we're going to be starting it off with Derek's opening, uh, followed by six minutes. Oh, we're going to start off with, got to hate when that happens. So six minute <laughs> rebuttal rounds uninterrupted, followed by open discussion. I will moderate as needed, but both of these gentlemen have been here before and they are good at keeping it equally timed and respectful. Then we'll be doing a question and answer period as always. So that's where I want you guys to send me in your best questions possible. So anyways, enough for me. We got our introductions out of the way. Let's hand it over to Derek Barnes for his opening statement. 12 minutes. Derek, whenever you're ready, you just let me know. I'll start the timer. And All right. I'll give you I'll give you guys a one minute warning um, once we reach that 11 minute mark. And whatever you guys don't use, we'll just toss into the discussion portion. So go ahead. The floor is yours, Derek. All right. I'm, I'm going to screen share right quick. All right. Let me set this up. All right. You see me? I see it. We're good to go. All right. Yes. Noah's awesome. flood fact of fiction. All right. Okay, so when discoveries in God's word, world, excuse me, conflict with the interpretation of God's word, Christians have three options. And this is any believer in general. You either abandon your faith in order to accept the results of science and essentially become an atheist or agnostic. Uh, deny the scientific evidence to maintain your interpretations of scripture or reconsider your interpretations of scripture in light of the evidence from God's creation. So in this last option, you still a Christian, but you, you, you just don't necessarily take everything found in the Bible to be literally true, you know, and this has been what Americans have been doing for the most part. Only 24 percent of Americans actually believe in the literal word of the Bible. All right. Forty seven percent believe it's just inspired by God and not to be taken literally. And uh, of course, 26 percent 
is that growing number of nuns, uh, N-O-N-E-S, that believe the uh, Bibles and all scriptures are essentially fables and histories and some good moral precepts that was recorded by men. So for my opponent, he, you know, you know, I, I didn't have a chance to really uh, chop it up with him to know everything uh, that he believes. But from my understanding, he is a young earth creationist. So he believes the earth is uh, around 6000 years old. Uh, the flood happened around 4000 years ago. All creationists believe this. Uh, not just young earth creationists. So that means that all human, all human, uh, all humanity, all animals are descended from those creatures that was on the ark around 4,000 years ago. So apparently God told Noah to build an ark. A pair of all animals traveled to the Middle East to board Noah's ark. Noah boarded with his three sons and their wives. It rained for 40 days and nights. Waters covered the tops of the mountains and earth is submerged for one year before the water receded, more or less. This is the general story. We'll get into it more. A bird was released and returned with an olive leaf demonstrating the existence of dry land. Animals disembarked and dispersed, repopulating the lands. And Noah's three sons and their wives are the forebearers of all humans alive today. All right. Now, what is the general evidence? When I, you know, research this, of course, uh, it, it usually came in like uh, four types in general. So it's what's found in the Bible itself, if it's to be taken literally. Of course, I'm arguing that the Bible should not be taken literally. And, and keep this in mind. This doesn't mean that you, you have to abandon your belief in God or stop being Christians or anything like that. It just means that the, the Bible is not to be taken literally. That's all. At least not everything. Uh, now, we know a lot of things written in the Bible is not true. For example, Jesus said that some of the people who are alive to witness and preach would bear witness to the Armageddon. And this is found in Matthew uh, chapter 24, verses 25 through 35. So either this is not true, and Jesus is wrong here, or there are people alive today over 2,000 years old. Uh, it's up to you to decide which is the more likely uh, scenario. All right. Uh, the next line of evidence is nearly all cultures found around the world have a flood narrative, which is true. But people need fresh water to live, so nearly all cultures in the ancient world live near bodies of fresh water. And bodies of fresh water has a tendency to flood, sometimes catastrophically. The flood stories around the world are too dissimilar to be talking about the same flood account found in Genesis. And I have, a, I have a long list of them, and we can go through these uh, these stories and see exactly if, they, if they're similar, if they, if they, if they link up, uh, and we can let the, the audience decide. Okay, another piece of evidence that I found compelling initially when I heard of it was that there are only three mitochondrial haplogroups found on the earth, uh, you know, that derive from the mother of mitochondrial DNA, uh, which is consistent with the three wives of Noah's son. All right, so I looked into that, and it turns out that that's not true. There are actually 20 haplogroups, 18 of which are found exclusively in African populations, uh, L1A through LFF, L3F, excuse me. There are only two non-African haplogroups, M and N, which derive from L3, which is found only in uh, African populations, L3 that is. So no, that's not the case. As, as, as a matter of fact, when you look at the mitochondrial haplogroups, found in humans, you actually discover that uh, it actually is evidence for the outer Africa evolutionary model. All right. So then the other thing, the, the last line of evidence in general is that geological evidence of the flood around the world, such as sediment deposits, spawning of earth and instant fossilization of some species. OK, this is actually evidence that many floods happen throughout the earth long history and they continue to happen to this day. Uh, we all heard, you all remember the tsunami that struck Japan and Indonesia and stuff like that. Uh, scarring of the earth and movements of boulders tell the story of receding ice sheets from the last ice age and fossilization of animals can follow catastrophic events predicted by punctuated equilibrium uh, and evolutionary theory. All right. All right. So here is uh, the actual scripture. I wrote it all out. I you know, got this from the uh, King James Version. I hope that's uh, everyone's preferred uh, Bible. If not, you know, it, it all tells the same story. I'm not going to read this whole thing. I, I don't have enough time for that, but I will go through some points. Uh, of course, we know that mankind was violent and God didn't like that. So he decided to uh, bring in floodwaters to destroy. Uh, if you look at the underlying section, to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is a breath of life. Everything that is on earth shall die. So that's everything. All right, so what God instruct Noah to do is to bring uh, two of every sort, uh, every you know, two of every kind, male and female, onto the ship, 
We see this in verse uh, 19 of chapter 6. But if you turn to chapter 7, verse 2 says, you shall take with you seven each of each clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean. So you have two different accounts, and this is very similar to like the uh, the, uh, the original Genesis, or not the original Genesis, sorry, but the uh, the story of Adam and Eve. So in, in the story of Adam and Eve, uh, in chapter one, uh, there was only uh, uh, man and woman was created at the same time. And that was like the last creation God did on the sixth day before he rested. But if you turn to chapter two, you discover that no, man, human man one was created first. All the other animals and plants and everything else like that came later. And then on the sixth day before God rested, he created Eve from Adam's rib. Two different accounts. Both accounts are found uh, very cl in close proximity to each other in the same story. OK, so moving right along. OK, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, and we know that Noah was 600 years old. If you look at chapter six, I'm just I'm just skipping through to where it's underlined at because those are some of the key points that I'm going to address. Uh, if you go to 11, it says 600th year of Noah's life in the second month. This is how we know how long it actually the water was on the earth for. It wasn't a year. It was actually for about uh, 10 months, uh, 10 and a half months. All right. Now. This image right here essentially captures what the ancient. Oh, and. and let me go back one because I, I didn't mention something. So let me go back right quick. All right. It says, uh, if you can see here, uh, on okay, on, on the day of the, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep. What is the great deep? Were broken up and the windows of the heavens were open. Right? Okay, so this is the, the ancient account of the universe. And the arch you're gonna see that's the firmament. Uh, the wavy line that goes across the top, that's more or less where the clouds and everything else is at. And then that hump in the middle is land, right? And now a better image of that would be found here. So now we see the great deep. So this is what the ancients thought the universe was. So not just the earth, the universe, all right? So they thought earth sat in a bowl, essentially, uh, floating, and that there was a great ocean underneath the land called the great deep. So that's where the, the, the springs where the water came and flooded the earth came from, from the great deep. And of course, the firmament, uh, that's where the rains came from, was the breaking open of the firmaments. So they believed that water was above them, and that's why the sky was blue. All right. So this is the same model, more or less, that flat earthers uh, go by. I don't know if uh, Nephilim Free is a flat earther, but uh, this is what the ancients thought uh, back then. This is not the way the universe is. We know that for a fact. All right. So moving right along with the story, with the narrative, it says the mountains were covered. If we go all the way down to verse 20 of chapter seven, uh, and then the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. And then we've turned to chapter eight. It says, then God remembered Noah and every living thing. So apparently he forgot. Uh, and this is the, the all knowing old wise God of the universe. He apparently forgot uh, that Noah was floating in, in, in ark, uh, you know, desperate, you know, probably running out of food. Uh, but then he does remember. And he uh, blows the the, uh, the rains away, so a, a, a wind passes over the earth. If we go to three, we see the waters begin to recede continually from the earth. And then if we turn to four, the ark rested on the seventh month on the mountains of Ararat. So that was apparently the highest height. It was able to rest there. Apparently, there's no land there yet because uh, Noah stayed on the ship with the animals for at least another three months. Uh, the waters receded continually to the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. But still, much of the earth was still covered and nothing, and nothing alive yet still uh, until a couple of weeks later. Uh, when uh, at some point a dove was let out, uh, you know, and this was after a series of other birds was let out to try to see if they were dry land. But a dove came back holding a freshly plucked olive leaf in their mouth but the question is and we'll get to this later how can they possibly have how can this this bird come back with a, with a plucked olive leaf a fresh one if all of the plants were submerged for months and months and months uh if you want to just take a, a olive tree or any plant and just overwater it you don't even have to submerge it to submerge it means to cut it off from air it cannot get oxygen because air, the leaves do breathe it respirates and it, and it won't be able to get access to the amount of sun that it needs to photosynthesize in order to keep itself alive. But apparently, uh, this bird was able to, to pluck a fresh olive leaf from the ground. Okay, And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, 
that the water was dry from the earth, and they'll remove the covering of the ark and look, and indeed the surface of the ground was dry. Here's another uh, head scratcher. If all you had to do was look, which apparently he did in chapter uh, 8, verse 13, then what was the point of sending the birds out? All right. All right, let's move on. So, you know, this is the rest of the story here. We learned about Noah's sons and everything else like that. Okay, my questions. Two of every creature or two of every unclean creature and seven pairs of clean. Which is it? It can't be both. Where did the waters come from? If there is no firmament, if the, if the way the model that the ancients believe is not the case, and we know it's not the case, then where did the water come from and where did the water go? All right. Now, how did the animals make it to the ark from faraway land surrounded by water? Like llamas in South America and kangaroos in Australia. How did they make one it? One minute, Derek. One minute. All right. Okay. Uh, you can see the other questions there. We can always come back to it if we move on to the next one. Was it a miracle? That would mean that uh, God miraculously transported animals. He miraculously ca uh, caused a global flood. Then he miraculously erased the evidence of the global flood. He then miraculously created all the plants, uh, caused all the plants and trees to regrow, and miraculously transported all animals back the way he wanted them. He then decided not to include any of this in his narrative or narrative that presents the images of the universe we know to be absolutely false. And because he's so good and merciful, he decided to save the diseases that otherwise would have died. Uh, that was one of the points that I didn't mention. But my question is, if that's all he wanted to do, why do all these miracles when he could have just snapped his finger like Thanos? Thanos seemed to have, you know, had a, a much better and concise and smarter game plan. Uh, the more likely scenario, there was no Noah. Animals were not gathered. There were many local floods that people told the same stories about over generations in the area. The Hebrew people told these stories uh, or heard these stories and found at least two of them, uh, and, uh, it, like at least two of them, reinterpreted through their religious lands and incorporated elements of both into the narrative. Uh, and then we could talk some of this other stuff. I'm, I, I know I'm going over. I'm sorry about that. So I'll leave it at that and, and we'll probably present the rest of the stuff a little later. No worries. No worries. Very clear, concise. Derek, I appreciate the presentation and the visuals. I always say I know how much work it takes to put those together, so I appreciate it. Um, we are now going to go over to Neff. I want to say to the chat, thanks for sending in your questions. The super chats, I am saving them. Definitely uh, maybe wait till the discussion to send your bulk of, of questions, make it easier. Uh, for me to to save them, but uh, perfect, Derek. That was twelve minutes. Neff, same thing for you. You've got twelve minutes. I'll give you a one minute warning, and ready on your first word. Uh, let me add your your share there. I can see it. Boom! You're good to go. Oh, Neff, um, I think you're muted. So if you want to. Restart, Neff. I'll restart the timer. Uh, here, I can un I can unmute you if you'd like. Uh, Neff, okay. we can hear you okay. now. Okay, good, sorry. I'll, I'll uh, okay, so I'll, I'll address, Derek, I'll address your misunderstandings that you mentioned uh, after in the um, discussion period. So uniformitarianism is the idea that the Earth is millions of years old is a new idea. Throughout human history, man has always believed the earth to be thousands of years old. Uniformitarianism claims that the idea is, uh, uniformitarianists claim the idea is verified by science, but it's not. It's a philosophy that's been refuted by 20th century science. To be a uniformitarianism is believed to be true by atheists because many millions of years of past time are necessary to believe in evolution is true. And because thousands of years for the existence of the earth and humans clearly supports the biblical account, which they reject. Uniformitarianism is believed to be true by evolutionist Christians because they have a problem with the biblical doctrine that Christ paid the penalty not just for sin conceptually, but for their sins specifically, which is an uncomfortable position for them. And they are, uh, and, uh, they are uninformed of the plethora of evidence which refutes uniformitarianism and have been brainwashed by secular media to believe evolution and deep time are true. Uniformitarianism is believed to be true by non-theist Christians because without scripture they have no solid foundation for theology or a true worldview and or they are uninformed about the plethora of evidence which refutes uniformitarianism and have been brainwashed by secular media to believe evolution and deep time are true. Uniformitarianism is never believed to be true because science actually demonstrates it is true because science refutes it. 
Um, evolutionists love to point at the fossil record, the ordering of fossils in the fossil record and claim that disproves the Noahic flood. That disproves the, uh, that, you, that uh, proves deep time is true. But that's not true. New scientists published way back in 1981. A large number of well-trained scientists outside the evolutionary biology, paleontology, have unfortunately got the idea that the fossil record is far more Darwinian than it is. It probably comes from oversimplification oversimplification inevitable in secondary sources, low-level textbooks, semi-popular articles, and so on. Although there is popular wishful thinking involved, in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions. In general, these have not been found, yet the optimi optimism has died hard, and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. One of the ironies of the creation-evolution debate is that creationists have accepted the mistaken notion that the fossil record shows a detailed and orderly progression and they have gone to great lengths to accommodate this fact in their flood geology. So if an evolutionist tells you, oh, well, the ordering of fossils, creatures in the fossil record shows evolution took place over millions of years. No, it does not. I know you hear that from evolutionists, but it is not true. Scientists know it's not true, but evolutionist laypersons don't know it because it's a myth. So to refute Science and the flood of Noah, my opponent must verify that the geological features of the earth are a vast age and or verify that the fossils and the sedimentary strata of the earth are millions of years age or verify that genetics that any organism has existed millions of years ago. Attempts to do this rely upon claiming that radiometric dating verifies that rocks are a vast age, but radiometric dating is not an empirical dating method and it relies upon assumptions. Showing they, or by showing that evolutionary order of fossils in the sedimentary strata verify millions of years of evolution, but the fossils are not ordered in that way. That's a myth. So the Noahic flood is verified by numerous geological features of the earth, most notably by the following. Virtually every culture of the world has legends of the flood reaching back into antiquity. This would not be true unless the Tower of Babel affair is true human history. If the Tower of Babel affair is true human history, both uniformitarianism and evolutionism are false. The continents are covered with an average of 1,800 meters and more of sedimentary strata. Sedimentary strata are created quickly in groups by rapidly moving water, which verifies the geologic column was created by a single catastrophic event, and uniformitarianism is false. Rapid subduction of massive slabs of the Earth's lithosphere deep into the outer core of the Earth. There is no geological me me mechanism for the initiation of plate tectonics. That's important. You need to remember this. There is no geological mechanism for the initiation of plate tectonics. There is none. Subducted slabs of the Earth's crust have been pushed deeply into the Earth all the way down to the, the outer core. They are a vastly different temperature than the materials around them. That's impossible if uniformitarianism is true. Genetics mutation rates, especially those to protein coding sequences, verify human beings have only been around thousands of years. This uh, writing about these subduction zones, this scientist at the University of National uh, University of Australia states, but how they originate is one of the biggest unsolved mysteries of modern earth science. Nobody knows. Scientists do not have a mechanism for how the Earth's crust cracked up into plates and began moving. They haven't a clue. But the Bible tells us. In Genesis 7:11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken open and the windows of heaven were opened. Scientists write, this is from NASA's website here, this is a screen cap. How and why escapes uh, uh, the interior of the heat, uh, it, it becomes concentrated in certain regions by into convection cells remains a mystery. They also say the fact that tectonic plates have moved in the past but, and are still moving today is beyond dispute, but the details of how and why they move will continue to challenge us scientists far into the future. So they don't have a mechanism for plate tectonics. This article, this science paper published in the Science Journal states the discrepancies in their models, there's discrepancies in every single scientific model for plate tectonics under uniformitarian time. They cannot account for it. They admit it in this paper right here. You go back and read it if you don't believe me. There's the fountains of the Great Deep. That's where the water came from. The mid-oceanic ridges that run around the earth like the seam of a baseball. That's where God split the crust of the earth and the water came forth to flood the earth. 
Evolutionists claim there's a cycle uh, where mat crustal material goes down into the earth by subdu runaway subduction, and it comes back up as hot material, as plumes of volcanic material. But there is no cycle. All we have is evidence that plumes do rise, but not anywhere near the rate necessary to equal the amount of material that's been subducted. So why? is because the subduction was caused by rapid plate movement during the flood, but there is no cycle where it goes down and comes back up again. That's a myth. This science paper shows a slab of material going deep into the crust of the earth, way down below the crust, into the outer core, to the outer core of the earth. The temperature difference stated by this scientific paper is 1260 degrees difference. Further studies that have been conducted since this paper was published show it's more like 3,000 degree difference. Now, that's impossible because if that material went down into the earth to the depth of the outer core of the earth at the rate your fingernails grow, which is what they are moving today, that's uniformitarianism, it would have heated up to the temperature of the material around it as it went down. It's impossible for that material to be 3,000 degrees cooler than the material around it if it's been down there. 250 million years. It's impossible. So how did it get there? It got there fast during the flood of Noah. It got there very fast in a matter of months. These are a few of the numerous scientific studies published in the Science Journal, seven every year are published, which show that water for, is formed uh, by uh, form strata in groups rapidly. These are folded strata in a mountain. The strata going off to the left are contiguous miles and miles and miles away from the strata, the mountain. They are the same strata 10 miles away that's inside the mountain and folded. This means this mountain didn't rise 20, from 20, feet, 20 miles down inside the earth or 10 miles down or one mile down. It rose from the surface of the earth because the same strata that's bent and is in that strata is also found 10 and 25 miles away to the side of the mountain. This material was soft, moist materials deposited, deposited by the Noahic flood, squeezed with horizontal pressure, and deformed. It's now concreted into solid rock. This refutes uniformitarianism. Solid rock doesn't bend. This material had to be soft sediments when it was deformed. There's no other way. There's two laws of science that prove the Noahic flood. The horizontal law of original horizontality uh, which put forth by Steno, and the law of continual later laterality. That means the strata found in a mountain are also found 10 miles, 30 miles, and 50 miles away from it. That means uniformitarianism is false. Uniformitarianists simply can't get on board with it. But the picture on the right is what you would see if uniformitarianism were true. The materials that are different colors in the strata, the reason they're different colors is because they're comprised of largely predominantly different materials. If these materials were deposited over vast geological time, as evolutionists claim, the materials would gradiate from one into another. But that's not what we see throughout the geologic column. We see abrupt boundaries between the strata, which means the one material stopped being deposited and another one being deposited on top of it immediately. There is no geological time for uniformitarianism in the strata of the Earth. Take, for example, these, this sandstone in the American Southwest. You can see the different formations that block them off with yellow blocks. Was, did, was there only one type of material available for deposition in that location for 50 million years? And then below it, another was only available for 50 million years? And then it sits on top of other strata that were allegedly laid down over vast periods of time. What's the logic in believing that 70 feet tall uh, or area of sa sand is only the material that's available for deposition in one place on the earth for 20 million years. Is there any logic to that? Even if it were deposited by the wind, and it couldn't be, it was deposited by water, it would not be pure sand. It would be full of crap. So it, it can't have been laid down over vast ages of time. It's irrational to believe that only sand is going to be deposited in one place on the earth for 40 million years. It's just nonsense. That material was deposited by the flood. This is an impact mark on the side of a mountain in California. It's so big you could put a four-story building inside of it. That means a boulder that weighed as much as a city block went scoring across the landscape at anywhere from 50 to 200 miles per hour and slammed into that mountain. Boulders that size don't go bouncing across the surface of the earth today. 
But if it were in 300 feet of water, a sheet flow moving off the continent at the end of the Noahic flood, and that water was moving anywhere from 70 to 200 miles per hour, it could slam into that mountain and kills that gigantic pit. This is proof of the Noahic flood. That cannot have happened if uniformitarianism were true. The erosion rates of this planet prove the continents can't even be here if there were 12 million years of time in the past. 12 million, they would be gone. This is a screen capture from BBC News. The people that live in those houses have watched one minute, 100. One minute. Okay, the people that live in those houses have watched 100 yards of their land disappear in their lifetime. And here too, California. This mountain has been rolled on its side. That can't happen if uniformitarianism is true. But God says in his word that he rolled the mountains because that's what happened during the flood. I, I don't have time, but I can go through the table of nations and show you that the names of the earliest tribes and cultures and empires on the earth are all named after the sons of Noah and his sons and grand, his, his grandsons. That proves that the Tower of Babel affair is true. If the Tower of Babel affair is true, uniformitarianism and secular history are not true. Therefore, secular history and the tower in uniformitarianism are not true. I guess that's all I have time for. Boom, just on time there, Neff. Great job. Uh, all right, gentlemen. So great opening presentations from the both of you. Loving the visuals. The chat is having a blast. Lots of great questions coming in as well. Uh, this is off to a great st uh, start. So now we are jumping into some rebuttal rounds. Six-minute uninterrupted rebuttals where the debater addresses each other's uh, points. So we're going to hand it over to Derek. And I'll remove Neff's. Uh, okay, there we go. So whenever you're ready, I'll start the clock. Once again, uh, Derek, uh, you are muted. Make sure you unmute yourself before you start talking. I'll give you a one-minute warning. So here we go. Okay. So when, first, uh, to begin with, let's talk about radiometric dating. Uh, if anybody doubts the power of uh, nuclear scientists uh, that they know what they're talking about, then how is it exactly they can create a nuclear bomb, right? Uh, it's an understanding of uh, the way uh, the nuclear processes in, 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 in the, uh, the core atoms work uh, and the half-lives and everything else like that, which allowed them to make the necessary calculations to devise of a nuclear bomb and create nuclear power plants. Uh, this is the same knowledge that they need in order to create like PET scans and everything else like that. If you ever had a PET scan done in a hospital, they, it, it uses radioactive... Um, uh, isotopes. I mean, I mean, I mean, this is clear. Like, I'm going to get the information as it relates to uh, the way nuclear uh, uh, nuclear things work from nuclear scientists who actually make uh, technology based on this knowledge. Uh, no disrespect to that from free. But clearly, these people know what they're talking about if they're able to make a, a nuclear bomb. All right. If we move on and uh, OK, no, uh, and, uh, no understanding of the initiation of, of plate tectonics. Come on. Uh, you know, we know how we, we know exactly how the Earth uh, pretty much formed from the accretion disk that was around the sun and it collected. Uh, we know it was molting. We know that the, 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 the crust cooled and we know that uh, the, uh, the mantle underneath the crust is moving and churning. All right. So a solid layer at, oh, would, was never would never form anyway. It would always be cracks there. And there's always area with uh, where gases and stuff are released from the belly of the Earth. So this is, you know, this is no matter of fact, I could probably just because I got my phone right here. We, I could probably just ask Siri, uh, <laughs> how, how, you know, how, how, how the, how the uh, tectonic plates perform. That, that, that's not a difficult question. Now. Um, the idea that the water, that the, 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 the great deep uh, that was referenced in the Bible was referring to the Marianas Trench uh, and that water came from there. That, that's absurd, I, especially if you know anything about geothermal energy, you know that the, the further you get deeper into the earth uh, crust, the, the hotter it gets. Water can't even exist at that temperature if you actually go deep into the Marianas Trench. It, 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 it's too hot. You, you actually get the, the, to the mantle at that point. All right. So so there, there is no water that's coming out of it. All right. Uh, we know where the, the earth's oceans came from. It actually came from comic bombardment early in Earth's uh, uh, history. Earth life, uh, when it was more debris that was floating around space, 
uh, in their accretion disk before uh, planets uh, can, you know, coalesce into uh, the spheres that they are and clear out their orbits. So we already know this information. All right. Uh, so that's that. Uh, what was the original? There are no geologists. If you actually talk to geologists, if you could do a a, 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 a poll on how many geologists think that the Earth is only six thousand years old, you, you'll find less than a handful. So the vast, the, the overwhelming consensus of science, uh, especially amongst uh, uh, geologists, when it came to, to this question, is that the Earth is is, is very old. All right, uh, and we and we know that radiometric dating techniques. Uh, nothing is perfect, of course. There's always room for error, and, and, and scientists are always updating figures, but that's expected in science because we're discovering things. As opposed to what we learn from on high in the Bible, the way it's described is the Earth is flat, there's a firmament above, and there's a great deep ocean beneath the Earth. This is not true. We know that for a fact. If science gets things wrong, fine. Science gets things wrong, we learn new things, we move on. The Bible is supposed to be the inerrant word of God. It got it wrong. Clearly. There is no coming back from that. I'll leave it at that. Hello? I can't hear anything. Looks like Standing for Truth stepped away for a second. Oh, I was going to okay. screen share something, but I can't. Um, first off, you have a misunderstanding of the scripture. Uh, Jesus where he used the word uh, uh, generation. Uh, he mm -hmm. didn't imply that people were going to live thousands of years. Uh, the Jews never believed in the model of the earth that you provided. That comes from Jewish mysticism after Jesus Christ's time. The, Jew, the Bible doesn't speak of such a thing. I know the atheists pass their idea around, but it's simply not true. The Bible does not describe that. It describes a round earth. It does not describe the model you showed nowhere in the Bible. Um, you said the olive leaf, where did it come from? Well, plants grow. I mean, it came from a seedling. The Bible does is not alluding that there was a gigantic olive tree, you know, that was 25 feet tall. It just had to be a seedling. Leaves pop up out of seedlings in a matter of weeks or months. So it didn't have to uh, grow to a full height. Uh, you say, where'd the water come from? It came from the mid-oceanic ridges. Water is still coming out along the edges of the mid-oceanic ridges all around the world. They're called black smokers or hydrothermal vents. Water above boiling temperature, a uh, higher than boiling temperature, is still coming out. And there's still massive amounts of water inside the earth, such as the Beijing anomaly, which is enough water to fill the North Sea. So. I think you have a lot of things you need to study. Uh, you, you said, um, how did llamas get to South America? Well, they have feet. They walk. Um, the, the continents, there were land bridges between the continents that are now underwater. You can read about that in science papers. Um, you say um, scientists uh, have, uh, you said, you mock the idea that scientists don't understand plate tectonics. I didn't say they fully misunderstand plate tectonics. I said they have no working model for the initiation of plate tectonics. Why the Earth's crust, lithosphere, would break up into plates and begin subducting. They don't have a clue. There's no model for that. They don't know. There's no reason they can think of that it should happen. And yet it has. So that's, and I provided two scientists, mainstream scientists, who state that. I, you seem to have glossed over that. Um, so I, I, you have some misunderstandings. Um, you mentioned radiometric dating. Well, radiometric dating is is a go-to for for people who just believe you uh, believe uniformitarianism. But there's lots of problems with radiometric dating. It's littered with assumptions. If you walked into a room and see a candle burning, um, and it's four inches tall, when how long has it been burning? You don't have a clue. You don't know because you don't know how tall that candle was when it was lit. You don't know if it was eleven inches tall or four or six inches tall. You haven't a clue. So you don't know how long it's been burning. Just because the material decays at a specific rate that gives takes millions of years for X amount of an isotope to be formed doesn't mean that that material has existed for millions of years. It could be that God created the world 6,000 years ago, and in it he put materials that decay at an outrageously slow rate. That doesn't prove anything. Radiometric dates are called radiometric because when they date a rock, they come up with five or six different dates. You know how they pick the one? 
they they choose whichever date corresponds to their idea about how old that thing is based on an in, what's called an index fossil and their presumption about how long ago that particular creature lived that's found in that strata or they think it was then they pick the date and they throw out the rest that's exactly how it works uh, so there's lots of problems with radiometric dating. If you date a rock that's t 25 feet down in the earth and you get a radiometric date of 1 million years, you dig down 50 feet down and date a rock and you get 20 million years, how do you know that water didn't wash the isotopes out of the one at the top and they collected in the one at the bottom? That's why you get an older date for the one at the bottom. That could very well be true because water washes radioisotopes into and out of water uh, rocks all the time, every time it rains, in fact. That's why there's uranium and plutonium and other isotopes in our drinking water, and government agencies talk about it and strive to find out how to prevent it. Because or your water has got plutonium in it, and it got in there because it got filtered out of the rocks that the water flowed through in the earth and dumped it in the reservoir that you're drinking from. So, so water washes radioisotopes into and out of rocks. Unless you can know the exact uh, how much water has moved what isotope into and out of a rock by what percentage over an, all of the age of that rock, radiometric dating won't help you one bit. It's not going to tell you any empirical age for a rock. But there are limiting factors as to how old the Earth can be. One of them is the salination of the oceans of this Earth. The rate at which the oceans are salinating tells, gives us an upper limit of 62 million years for the age of the oceans. That's not how old they are. That's an upper limit. They can be no more than 62 million years. If they were 150 million years old, they'd be so full of salt right now, they'd have choked everything in them to death. There would be no life in the oceans. They'd be dead. They'd be nothing but pure salt water. Because the, one, this minute sal left. one minute. This salination process can't have been going on for hundreds of millions of years. So I haven't heard any evidence that the Earth is a vast age. I've just heard you appeal to consensus, secular, uh, secular scientific consensus. That does nothing for me. I've heard you appeal to radiometric dating. It's a flawed process. It relies on, on assumptions. And I've heard you naysay against the Bible. I've provided scientific evidences. You've provided nothing but naysaying and appeals to authority. That's what I see. That's uh, oh. Awesome. Just on time with 40 seconds to spare. And Derek, you, you you had a couple minutes left. So what I did is I put another few minutes. We'll just throw it right into the discussion portion. So that being said, we're now moving to the open discussion period. Everybody's favorite part, of course. As always, we like to keep it as equally timed and respectful as possible. Let's make sure we are addressing each other's points and keeping it on topic. Uh, since Neff just finished with his uh, six-minute rebuttal, Derek, of course, you can start the discussion off However, you you please actually before you do, I want to point out I forgot to earlier after show on John Maddox's channel. And guys, now that we're in the discussion portion, start throwing all your questions at me and I'll save as many as I can. So, Derek, however, you'd like to start the discussion. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Oh, Derek, my apologies. You're on mute. But uh, OK. No all right. All right. Ah uh, yeah, so let me just clear up some uh, misunderstandings when it comes to uh, radiometric dating. All right, so number one, when you have something that is molten, since it can move around, uh, what happens is you essentially reset the clock. So if you look at say a volcanic eruption, that fresh lava that comes out is going to have radiometric elements in it. It's going to have a uh, uh, you know those heavier elements in it that radiate. That's where the, that's where uh, radiometric dating comes from is radiation. So it radiates. So it radiates gamma waves. I mean, excuse me. Uh, it, it radiates gamma radiation it, it, and it lets off uh, uh, alpha and beta particles and stuff like that. And this is how. And then it, it, it uh, and then if you have a group of it, you're going to have some measure of them that is going to say like for uranium, for example. Uh, some measure, if there's a certain amount of uranium found in a specific sample, there's going to have uh, some ratio of them that's going to dec de uh, decay into like thorium and stuff like that. Now, when it's in a molten state, you will just have the uranium. And it, 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 but once it dries and it's no longer molten, you're going to have a perfect sample at that time. It's going to be fully uranium. That, 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 that's the measure. And then you can actually date it from there. So you actually have the length of the candle. 
once it was molten and when it is not molten. And we know that the radiometric dates are, are fairly accurate simply because we use multiple dating methods to verify it and not just radiometric dating. We can actually use deontology, the, the study of tree rings, and also ice core samples with verified it. So those other ways that we date things and they all consistently uh, have a general uh, un, uh, agreement and a specific date demonstrates the process. Well, uh, you have some misunderstandings about dating methods. Uh, I'd like to screen share something with you. And I think, I think you're in for a shock. Right. Um, here's some information for you you're probably not aware of. This is Richard Mauger, assistant, uh, assistant professor of geology, North Carolina University. He says, in general, dates in the correct ballpark are assumed to be correct and are published. Those in disagreement with other data are seldom published and discrepancies are rarely explained or fully or not fully explained. Um, so, and E.H. Andrews, professor of materials, uh, University of London states, whatever the figures arrived by the date tests, we are weeded out before publication in journals if they do not concord with preconceived dates to be to be, uh, the evolutionary geologic column. And, and one more here, J.E. O'Rourke published, he said, the intelligent layperson has long suspected circular reasoning in the use of rocks to date fossils and fossils to date rocks. The geologist never bothers to think of a good reply, feeling the explanations are not worth the trouble, uh, uh, the work it, 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 that it brings. Uh, th this is supposed to be a hard-headed paradigm. Uh, uh, paradigm. So uh, there are problems with radiometric dating. It's not an empirical thing. There are no empirical methods for dating rocks. There isn't any. You have to rely on assumptions. Okay. So, and, and 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 a little more information for you. There's a lava flow at the bottom of the Grand Canyon called the Unicaret Lava Formation. It's been dated at dates anywhere from 10,000 years to 1.3 billion years using different radiometric dating processes and, and everything in between from 10,000 years to hundreds of thousands of years to a few million to many million to hundreds of millions to 1.1 billion 1.2 billion years they've gotten all those different dates using different dating methods how old is it is it a hundred thousand years old or 1.2 billion years old nobody knows because they keep getting wrong dates and here's something to consider if lava formation flows and it's got let's say uranium in it and that uranium flows with as the material flows, and it comes to a stop as it cools down and becomes solid, solidified as rock, right? So how much of that isotope, daughter isotope, how much of the parent isotope was in that flow and came to a stop at that exact spot? And then here comes a scientist along to date it. Oh, it's this old. How does he know that? He doesn't know that because the materials are mixed and they're flowing in a liquid rock, a semi-liquid rock, and, and it becomes fixed when it cools down. That doesn't prove that material has been fixed in that location for 20 million years. Whatever percentage of what parent and daughter isotope is in that rock is simply what was in that rock when it stopped flowing and cooled down enough to become still. See? That throws a gigantic wrench in your dating methods. Now, Derek, I'd like for you to explain to me, if the Noahic flood isn't true, why is the Earth covered with 1,000 average of 1,800 meters of sedimentary strata, which are known to be laid down by water, rapidly moving water verified by laboratory experiments since the 1950s? How do you account for that? Okay. All right. Right quick. Right quick. All right. Two things, and, I, and I'll, I'll account for that, sedimentary rock, I'll account for that. All right, number one, uh, that base uh, measure of the ratio between thorium, for example, and uranium is going to be in the mantle, so, and this is going to be the same. So whenever a uh, fresh lava comes out, it's always going to have that same ratio because it's coming fresh out of the mantle. So that's the base measure. And then we can measure from there. Now, how do we date uh, the various layers? Very easy. When volcanoes erupt, it spews forth ash that gets swept all over the world. This is, of course, we know this uh, this amount based on volcanoes that take place. It's in the atmosphere. And then when these collect and form these layers, those are the things that we're dating for. So this volcanic ash that actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, envelopes the world, essentially, when during major catastrophic uh, 
volcanic eruptions. So we know those, and of course, we can verify that through uh, ice bowl samples. So not just in those same particles, those same ash is, is collected uh, in the poles, and we can do, we could drill down into it. We know each year through the layers of the ice buildup exactly how many years back it was, and then we could take a ratio. We know when a volcano actually erupted, and we can verify that, and, and this is how we get these dates, all right? One other thing you mentioned right quick was that water was coming out of these trenches, like the Mariana stretch, you, you mentioned that those black columns. Uh, yeah, uh, they're black because uh, water is not being spewed out of these cracks. Mantle is be being spewed out of these cracks and all types of chemicals coming from the interior of the earth. The reason why uh, the water is boiling because the water around these hot areas where the mantle is coming out is hot and that's why it's boiling. All right, so the black columns is not water or black water coming out. The black columns are the interior of the earth spewing forth chemicals superheated, which is causing the water to boil. So that's not true. All right. Uh, now, when it comes to the sedimentary rock, it's very easy. Uh, we know there are areas of sublimation where the crust is going down into the interior of the mantle. And we know there's areas where, like, you know, where, where uh, plate tectonics crash together and they form the mountains as they keep pushing up. This is how the Himalayas would fall. Uh, when India slammed into the uh, the the, uh, the Asian the, uh, uh, plate, right? So essentially, those sedimentary that's the ocean bottom. So that's that's where that's at. So the the, the ocean bottom is being pushed up uh, because of plate tectonics, and this is where all the sediment is coming from. We see sedimentary rock all the time on beaches. So just the tide creates uh, sedimentary rock, and that's what sand is. All right. So, Derek, okay, um, you said uh, lava is always going to have the same amount of thorium in it. I, I, that's, I don't know where you got that idea. That, that's preposterous. Thorium, it's not like the thorium is homogeneously spread throughout all lava of the earth. I, I don't, that's ridiculous. I don't know where you got that idea. Uh, nobody, uh, the black smokers, uh, it's water coming out of them. The water is above boiling temperature. My point was, water is still coming out from along the side, all along the notoceanic ridges and through black smokers, because the bottom of them is bowed up with basalt that's sealed it off. Water is still not coming out of the trench itself. It's coming out all along the edges of the trenches in black smokers. That just shows that there's massive amounts of water associated with the mid-oceanic trenches. That's what that shows. Um, you said... Um, Ice cores. Ice cores, uh, it used to be believed, Derek, that ice, uh, the, each layer of ice they find in an ice core represents a single year. But that idea has been b blown to pieces. That's not what's believed anymore. That's, that's false information. And one fact that just proves that is in 1944, some American uh, naval pilots crashed, uh, Air Force pilots, uh, Air Corps, actually crashed some P-38 aircraft on a glacier in Greenland. They went back 60 years wondering what happened later, wondering what happened to their planes. They guessed where they found them. They found them uh, 258 feet down inside that glacier with thousands of layers of ice on top of those planes. They actually recovered those planes by melting the ice with heat blowers and pumping the water out. They went down inside that thing, the glacier, and retrieved those aircraft, and they're flying today. So those airplanes were buried by thousands and thousands of layers of ice, 258 feet deep. And none of those layers represented one year. A layer in ice represents a snow event. The snow melts slightly. It gets compacted a little bit. Another snowfall comes. You can have five snowfalls in one day in Greenland five different ones. So you've got some false uh, ideas here. Some, uh, but I'm not hearing you account, give me any evidence that uniformitarianism is true. All I'm hearing you tell me is that radiometric dating proves it somehow, and that's how we know. I haven't heard any argument for uniformitarianism except that. And I've provided some powerful scientific evidence that uniformitarianism isn't true, such as slabs of material going all the way down to the core of the earth that are of up to 3,000 degrees difference in temperature. There's no way to account for that. 
that could be shoved down there during the uh, during the uh, uh, Noahic flood. They had to have been put down there rapidly, and they can't have been down there for millions of years. I'm just not hearing any evidence uh, for that uniformitarianism is true, except relying on radiometric dating. And I'll say this about tree ring dating. Tree ring dating has almost been completely given up by scientists because it's been discovered that trees produce so many false rings that it throws a big cog in the process. That, and you can't... How old is the oldest tree anyway? The oldest tree in the world is roughly uh, a few thousand years old. That's not going to give you uniformitarian time. So uh, what's this evidence that uniformitarianism is true and the earth isn't just thousands of years old? Okay. All right. Right quick. Now, one of the things you mentioned, especially uh, before you, uh, uh, the, the, the time before you spoke, was that uh, I would be surprised to find in papers that are saying that the dates that everyone agrees to, those are the ones that's published and the one that's not agreed to is the ones that's not published. And I would be shocked by that. I'm not shocked by that. That's called peer review. All right. So we already know historically that scientists in general have no problem accepting the evidence the way it is. And if it changes their mind, it changes their mind. So Einstein with relativity changed the paradigm. He, that was a paradigm shift. All right. This is the same thing for quantum mechanics. So if you have the evidence, uh, scientists in general has demonstrated historically that they have no problem changing their minds. If you said you presented all of the scientific evidence that you presented today, then the question is, why is the consensus among scientists still that the Earth is millions of years old, billions of years old? Excuse me. Well, I can uh, just explain that. But uh, scientific consensus, Derek, is not scientific evidence. The opinions of a group of men who have like thinking is not scientific evidence. You understand the difference, right? What they say is their opinion about how they interpret the evidence is not the same thing as the actual evidence itself. Like, I didn't provide you with a, somebody's opinion that the temperatures of the slabs of rock or, or deep. I, I provided you with a statement by a scientist that states emphatically the material is that great a difference. That's what the data shows. It's not a scientific consensus that the difference in temperature is there. It's what the data shows. That's what I'm looking for from you. Scientific data that shows the earth is millions of years old. Because I haven't heard any argument that refutes anything I've said. Okay, right quick. Yeah, that's that scientist, that one scientist's opinion. If that data was so overwhelming, then he would have been able to change the minds of other scientists. No, he it's published in more than one it. journal by more than one scientist. It, 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 it's, it's an understood fact. The slabs of this material that are deep in the earth are of greatly different temperature. Nobody argues about it. The scientific yeah, community uh, isn't up in arms about it. They're not denying it. They're not arguing about it. They accept that data. That's that is true because it's not data against uniformitarianism. Because it's not data because that's just data. It's not data uh, uh, against uniformitarianism. Well, certainly, because if is. it was, it, well, if it was, then they wouldn't be uniformitarians. Well, let me explain why it is, Derek. If yeah. you have a slab of the Earth's lithosphere that's been shoved all the way down and it's gone down, they think dragged, dragged by you know, uh, uh, runaway subduction, dragged down to the outer core of the Earth. That's uh, uh, 1800 miles down and uh, where the temperature is a, a few thousand degrees but the material this massive slab of material allegedly got there over uniformitarian time now think Derek think for a second mm -hmm. that means that roughly the speed your fingernails grow let's give them let's uh, give them the benefit of the doubt and say five ten times that much let's say it grew it went down at one inch a, a month that's huge fast that's not what they believe, but let's pretend it went down there at an inch a month. Mm -hmm. You really willing to believe that this material can be pushed down into the earth where it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter till it gets to a couple thousand degrees at the rate of one inch per month, which is vastly faster than scientists actually believe it moved to get there. And it's not going to heat up to the temperature of the materials it's being pushed down into. You really believe that's plausible? Uh, I, I haven't looked at that study. I have to look at the study. But clearly, it, it, from, from our perspective, uh, I think it, you're reading something wrong into it. Because if that was such compelling evidence, I'm pretty sure that scientists would have already uh, rallied to it and accepted it, especially considering the fact there is a significant amount of scientists who are, uh, who are Christians. And if they wanted to use that evidence to boast the idea that Christianity is true, uh, they would have done so. There would be no reason for them they not to. They are talking about and, it. 
and and scientists, of course, get famous by proving other scientists wrong. That's how you get a Nobel Prize. So Derek, let me help you understand this. Nobody argues that the temperature is that different. The scientific geolog geologists of the world accept this data. Okay, it's right. not some whack jobs opinion. This is published in mainstream journals like Nature. Okay, it's accepted. This is simply the data, and the scientists are left scratching their heads to try to figure out how to account for that. They have models. Guess what? They've mm -hmm. got ideas about how it's possible that the material could be so great in difference. You don't even know what they are. I know what that, that is, but I'm going to tell you it doesn't account for it because I'm going to say it's irrational to believe that that material got down there at the rate your fingernails grows and didn't heat up to the temperature of the material around it. It had okay. to have gotten down there fast. And okay. see, the Noahic flood, Derek, can explain that. Subduction, runaway continental drift, run, continental sprint during the flood of Noah could explain how it got shoved that deep into the earth and not be heated up. But Derek, can you understand that it can't have been down there? It can't go down there at that rate and, and still not heat up to the temperature of the materials around it. Can you imagine pushing a rock slowly down into a, a, into the earth where it gets hotter and hotter and hotter mm -hmm. at the rate your fingernails grow and it not gets hot it, and it doesn't get heat up to the temperature of the materials around it? That's not uh, logical, is it? Well, no, I actually can imagine it depends on how sensitive the, the temperature device is that actually measures the temperature. And if the rock is so solid where the mantle all around it is liquid and it, it, doesn't, it didn't heat up to the point where it, it was no longer solid. That's then it why. Could, why would it? Those temperature dips. Uh, well, that, would, that would cause uh, uh, a, a temperature difference right there. I don't why know the mechanism. I, I, that, I just said that off the top of my head because I don't know. I would have to look at the studies. But for some reason, it's not having scientists jettisoning uh, uniformitarianism. I have and, some scratching their heads. That's well, what it has. Sure. There's a lot of questions. Of course. There's a lot they're of trying questions to explain this to incredible them. anomaly. That's right. what they're trying to do. And and, and my, my point is that if it got there rapidly, that's where we could see that the material wouldn't be the temperature of the materials around it. It would be so much cooler. That that fits with it being shoved down in there quickly. Mm -hmm. It hasn't had time to heat up. See, but maybe, it, maybe, model. but maybe that's not the crux of the evidence for why scientists accept uniformitarianism. Maybe there's an overwhelming amount of other evidence that give them uh, reason to believe in uniformitarianism. Like what? And, well, radio message radio for one. All well, right. Well, I appreciated that. What about uh, what's next? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but you did not refuse radio metric data. And the reason why is because I know scientists who use uh, the ideas of radio metric data to create bombs and, and F fMRI scans and PET scans that's, and everything that's, like that. So, because uh, they can use it to make a bomb doesn't mean uniform materialism is true. That mean, the because other material thing, decays doesn't mean, doesn't make uniform materialism true. You have to show it means they understand material. nuclear science. It means they understand nuclear science. Okay, and, nuclear and, science doesn't prove uniform materialism true. Just because the material decays and we know mm -hmm. that it does, that in itself does not prove uniform materialism is true. All right. And then uh right quick, because you 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 made a, you asked a question of how you know how we can date trees and stuff like that and uh, and uh, a whole idea of the ontology. And you said that the oldest trees only go back a few thousand years. I'm gonna share screens right quick. Uh and let's go down to uh uh, You're gonna bring up the tree that's believed to be ten thousand years old, but they've never cut it open to count the rings, right? Oh, oh, oh no! They they actually uh, did accurate tests for all these. So you have the so how many tree. false rings are in the tree, dear? dear. Uh, we, we're gonna look at ex exactly if you want to. We can go to the link. Each one of those has a link where it actually talks about how the tree is actually dated. So we can go there and I can show you the papers on Alice. But the Methuselah tree, of course, ironically named after Noah's grandfather. Uh, forty-eight uh, uh, thousand. I mean, four thousand eight hundred fifty years old. That's how many, how many false rings are in it, Derek? Uh, we'll see. We'll see exactly how they did it. Uh, but the oldest actually go back around eighty thousand years. Mm. So not you saying uh, a tree is eighty thousand years old? A whole tree. Yes. You see this it has this eighty thousand rings. No, no, no. It doesn't have eighty thousand rings. <laughs> we can see how it was dated. Once again, we can see how oh, it was dated. All right. Radiometric so, dating. So which not radio metric day. Hey, let's let's go on and click on the link so we actually see right. corresponding rings in different trees. All right, let's see how how do we know uh, how old the tree is? Okay, okay. So if you read this here, 
Uh, okay, because the entire world is really just one organism, mass root system, but da, 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 da. Uh, it spread 8,000 years ago from the seed to size of a purple grain. Uh, research link, let me see. Yeah. Okay, synapses. Da, 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 da. Oh, it's the, one of the oldest. Yeah, I think you made a mistake. I think they, they I, believe the I forest have to has find been it. there. I they believe the forest has been there for 80,000 years. They don't believe any tree is 80,000 years old. No, 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 no. That's one tree. That's the thing. It's one root system. Each one of those are like uh, trunks of that one tree. So it looks like a forest. It looks like multiple different trees, but it's only one tree. That's no, the thing. No tree has 80,000 rings. So it's at the rate that these things sprout at. This is how they can tell the age of the, uh, yeah. of no, the system. No, no tree has 80,000 rings, Derek. Uh, no one said 80,000 rings necessarily. Okay, so then how are you going to date a tree to be 80,000 years old? You're talking about uh, that's a dead not the only tree, way. A fossil tree? That's not the only way that they date them. So that's not the only way that they date them. I'm not hearing right. scientific evidence that a tree is 80,000 years old. I'm hearing it you was, say that somebody says so. Well, you can look it up. I, you now know the name of the tree. I've and now you can do trees. the research. And then you yeah. can do the research. You can see how old... Uh, how many see. false rings are there in the trees that you point to that are allegedly up to 7,000 years old? Okay. Until uh, 2012, the oldest known tree was a Methuselah tree, age verified by cross dating, also sampled by Schulman. You're going to do your research in your debate? It's not sure when the age of the term. I'm, I'm showing you right here. If you want, I can send you all the links. You know, you know, you now have the names of I'm not hearing a scientific tree. explanation for how they can know that the tree is uh, 5,000 or 9,000 years old without cutting it down and counting the rings and uh, an explanation of how they know which rings are true rings and which ones are false. Do you know that trees can produce far more than one ring in a year, right? This is why right. there's just problems with date tree ring dating. But, so, but here, here, here's the beautiful thing, though. If we know how many rings it produces in a year, then we can count those. We right don't know. Many. Yes, we can because we have trees around us and we can cut open the tree and then we can cut open another tree uh, uh, the next year or the same tree a little uh, lower in their okay. base. And then we can count those rings and we can see uh, exactly how okay. many rings are producing each year and oh, we can still count back how many years. I see. So, You're not even aware of the fact that trees produce false rings. I, that's what I'm getting. No, I am. So let me let me inform you of something. But here's the thing: trees, you can you can you, you trees can produce a lot those. of false rings, Derek. And and if you cut a tree in half and it's got seven thousand rings, you don't know whether that tree is seven thousand years old, five thousand years old, or forty five hundred years old, or twenty nine hundred years old, because trees produce lots of false rings. This is scientifically something that wasn't discovered until the last several decades, and that's why tree ring dating is not something that's largely talked about in the scientific community anymore because it's it was it's a dud for them i'm uh, sorry that, it's a dud uh, that's simply not true you it, asserting it that dud. you asserting that the scientific community doesn't talk uh, about tree rings they hardly is, ever sir, especially considering the fact that are you a scientist sir they no are you no, I am not. So, I'm, okay. to make sure what so the I'm, just, I'm just telling you what I've known from my research that scientists don't hardly ever rely on dating trees by rings anymore. It's something they've almost completely given up because they the, of the discovery that trees produce lots of false rings. See, you, that's an you, old you can idea. You still count the false Derek, rings, though. Derek, uh, you don't if know, you know which if one you know is true a, and which one If you know a tree produces four false rings each, you know, each you year. You don't know that. It's, Nobody it's, knows that. Nobody but, knows that. You can and actually each year you can count how many false rings no, that the tree no, produces. No, you can't, Derek. And then the next so, year you can count how many false rings that the tree produces. And the next year you can count how many false no, rings the tree produces. You can and only then cut you can a tree use that data to count it backwards. Derek, because, you can only cut a tree down once. So yeah. also you could have a tree that, that produces five rings in a year, and right next to it, a tree that produced only one in the same year. Okay. Or two. Okay. See, so dating. If it, you, if you grow, if, date, if you tree grow, ring dating is a dud. That's why it, it's not. They they don't rely on it anymore. You yeah. asserting that tree ring dating is a dud. It is just like it does not raise. Just, it does like not rise to the level where I'm going to accept. It. When scientists say that tree ring dating is a dud, then I may consider well, that. Why but don't you read the articles where scientists acknowledge that tree ring dating uh, uh, has Scientists still use uh, tree dating methods. That is a fact. 
Uh, Garrett, I, I, to use that. I'm just going to point out to you something. I hope you'll research it. If you do the study, if you, you look into it, you'll find that scientists acknowledge that tree ring dating has become specious because of tree rings, uh, false tree rings. Just like it used to be believed, Derek, that a single ice layer in a glacier represents one year. Today, we know that's not true. That idea is goes back 150 years. The, the, it's been, it was held to till the 1950s and the 60s and the early 70s. And since since then, they've discovered, oh, wait, we've got 20 layers of ice created in Greenland last month. You know, so uh, it's it's been it's a dud. I'm sorry. I'm not okay. hearing scientific evidence. The Earth is a vast age. Where's the millions of years come from? And I asked you if you could explain to us why the Earth is covered with 1800 meters to, to three miles or more, six miles in places, a sedimentary strata laid down by rapidly moving water. The whole continent, all the continents, if the Earth hasn't been globally flooded, why are the continents covered with millions of strata laid down in by water that was moving rapidly, which buried creatures alive? Why not? You you accept sublimation. You know that that occurs. You know that the earth that's on the land that we're walking was once submerged underwater. And you know, you, yes. you, you said it yourself that it's, it's, go, it's being submerged at the same rate that your fingernails grow. So you know this information. No, no I so don't. So why are you asking that. this question? <laughs> no, I don't believe it was buried by the water. Nobody believes it was buried by water at the rate your fingernails grow. You're mixing up facts. No, no, no. Yet. Not buried by water. No, 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 no. I'm saying, where where is the earth? being created from, from like the Marianas Trench and stuff like that. This is what's spreading out. That's why that ridge is there. In between those plates, that's what's spreading it out, right? So fresh earth is being created at the bottom of the ocean. Well, you're welcome Sedimentary. to believe that, but the that's data doesn't fact. show that. <laughs> that's a fact. No, that's an idea. Right. It's, it's not it. In human lifetime, we haven't seen any material grow up out of there. Sorry. It's not been okay. observed. Okay, that's simply it's not, not true. Observed. That's it's not, not true. We can measure so, it. So no, it's, all, it's all not, you're doing right is now true. is this is a logical fallacy. It's called uh, ignoring the counter evidence no, or, no or, evidence or, or denying the counter evidence. So you're, you're, no. you're either denying or you're ignoring evidence. And sure. that's fine. You can do that. If you want to deny or ignore scientific evidence in order to accept uh, your belief in the Bible, that's great. But the reality is that the idea that what scientists are saying absurd is absurd. When you believe that for 40 days or 40 nights it rained, it covered all the earth. The rain and that, wasn't what caused the flood, Derek. You have and, 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 and the, 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 uh, the, the birth, the spring of water from the great deep, yeah. which does not exist. There is no great deep. So the there is idea, no great deep? There is no great deep. No. Well, well, no six deep. miles down, the, the, the uh, mid-oceanic trenches are not six miles down. There's no great deep. Okay, that's not spewing for water. So that's yeah, not the true. hydrologic vents that line that those ridges all across the earth are putting forth boiling hot water. Yes, uh, they are. Sorry, it's not. Yeah. If that is the case, then the, the so then the, the waters the will be the waters will be rising faster than what global warming is is making it rise. At. <laughs> if that Derek, was the case, Derek, let me explain <laughs> so that's, something that's to true. you. Let me all explain right. something to you. Every scientist on the planet knows. That there are hydrothermal thermic vents uh, that course. line that line the mid oceanic trenches going all around the world and water's coming out of them. It's a fact. That's okay. not a fact. Uh, that is, is a fact, fact, Derek. Is that fact, hot, Derek, Derek hot let, me, let, me, let, let me speak for a minute. Yeah, I let you talk on the mic for about a minute and a half now. I'd go like ahead. just a few right, seconds. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Yep. So what I just said is a scientific established it, it's considered fact. No scientist argues against it. You seem unaware of this. I don't understand why. Hydrothermal vents line the mid ocean ranges going all around the world, and hot water is coming out of them everywhere all around the earth. Okay, that's a fact. You seem you say that's not true, but it's true. Secondly, I um uh I, I haven't heard you account for how why the earth can be covered with eighteen hundred meters and more of sedimentary materials which are known and observed in the laboratory to be produced by rapidly moving water which buried billions of creatures and sealed them in sediments. How is it possible that the earth hasn't been globally flooded if the continents are covered with materials that were uh, laid down in uh, layers that have were produced by moving water, which buried creatures alive. All the continents are covered with deep sediments. How does that occur under uniformitarian time? Uh, sediments formed at the bottom of oceans. As the uh, continents spread apart and other areas are being submerged, the land that we're walking on now has been exposed to the air that was once underneath the ocean. 
Very easy to uh, to explain. This is not a difficult thing to explain. Uh, so if you don't want to accept that fact, that's fine. But that is under the reality. The yes. Okay. So, it's under under the ocean. so that I have a question yeah. about that. So now the sedimentary, one of the primary features of sedimentary strata is that they have a fine, distinct boundary with one above the other. You can see the difference in the strata going all the way up through the geologic column. The vast majority of the geologic column is comprised of these strata. And you can look at them, cut into it, and look at it horizontally, and you'll see the fine boundary where one strata ends and abruptly, right immediately above it, begins another one of a different color, different type of material, a different a mixture of materials. The boundary between them is super fine. That's a problem. Think about this. If those materials were laid down over vast periods of time, how come the boundary between those layers is paper thin? Can you explain that? If the material, if the strata were laid down over long, long ages of time, why didn't the materials gradiate as one becomes less available to that environment for deposition and another material begins to be uh, inundate that area? There would be a gradation. You would see the materials gradiate from one color into the other. There would be no fine boundaries between them, you see, but that's not what we see. And what's been observed and repeated in the laboratory numerous, numerous times going all the way back to the 1950s, and it's published seven times a year, according to the U.S. Geological Survey, seven papers a year are published by hydrology, by sedimentologists that show that in the laboratory setting, we reproduce exactly what's in the geologic column by with rapidly moving water right before your eyes in real time, the strata form right as they're watching it. This verifies with real observable testable science that sedimentary strata are formed rapidly. How do you get off telling the world that these strata were laid down over vast ages when they don't radiate and science has verified since 1952 in the laboratory, the strata are produced in real time as fast as you can watch it? Okay, do you know uh, what happens in a, a centrifuge? If you put in various liquids or materials of various densities in it and you spin it, what happens? Uh, this is the same thing that happens. If you're pulverizing rock and this the earth is, is not a centrifuge. Uh, 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 just pay attention to what I'm saying. I'm just I'm trying to make a point. Um, it's an it's a, a, a analogy. All right. So if you get pulverized rock that spread out through the ocean, what's going to happen? is that those that are less dense are going to be at the top layer when it settles down and the ones that are heavier are going to drop faster. And this is how this is going to lay out and is going to continue to do this as it grinds up and pulverizes more rock. The stuff that is heavier is going to sink to the bottom faster than the stuff on top because that's the way things work. All right. And that's how the sedimental, uh, sedimentary layers are layered like that. Okay. That's that, that, I want to screen share something. Uh, Standing for truth, are you there? I want to screen share something, please. I want to, I want to show, show Derek something, if I can. And, and why are you doing that? Derek, oh, yeah. Derek, yeah, Derek, I want to show you, uh, you're, you have great misunderstanding about how sedimentary, uh, sedimentary strata form. You just got through claiming that these materials settled down out of the waters in the oceans. That's not how sedimentary strata form. This what you're watching now is video of an experiment at Colorado State University. This is not a Christian college. They're not fully young earth creationists. These are Dutch uh, hydrologists and sedimentologists, and they're producing. This is the hydrology laboratory, sedimentology laboratory at Colorado State University. And here's sedimentary strata forming right before your eyes as fast as they can watch it. This is how science is verified since 1952, dozens and dozens of times in university setting. The sedimentary strata don't form because water materials in the water settle downward and lay upon each other. That's not how they form. You can see that sedimentary strata forming from left to right across the screen in real time, right before your eyes. That's I, I how I, sedimentary I don't see the video strata. Playing. I, you got to play the video. You don't, don't see it. Yeah, no, I don't see it playing. Okay, well, I, it's playing on my end. I, I'm not sure why you're not seeing it. Um, uh, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, uh, I, I, I uh, 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 can you see? Can you see the video playing, Santa for Truth? Okay, wait a minute. I had no. it playing on a different page. Uh, and then, okay. okay, and then real quick, uh, so make here, sure that 
you click the audio button to uh, now. Well, there's no okay, but there's no audio. Oh, oh there's no audio. No, that's fine. Uh, yeah. So let me let me start again. Okay, here now. Do you see? Do you see yeah, the video? The video. Yes, yes. Okay. All right. So this is the Colorado State University Lab Hydrology Laboratory. Okay, and this is a sleuth. This is a very expensive uh, half a million dollar setup they've got here, and this is sedimentary strata forming right before your eyes in oh, real now, time. Do you want to read? Okay. Reshare. I'm not. I just see. I personally black, screen, yeah. black box. <laughs> Me too. Uh, okay. So oh, there we, we go. We're good. We're good. Wait. Okay. Is it sharing or not sharing? I'm, I'm it looks like the video is paused now. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'll try sharing. Now is it playing? Uh, Can you no. see it? No. Uh, okay. There we. There we go. All right. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Okay, something is wrong. I don't know what's going on. Let me try screen sharing it one more time. I think I had two windows open. Oh, now it's playing. There. Now, you see sedimentary strata forming right before your very eyes. This, it, has, it been verified. So, this has been verified. Yeah, this has been verified by numerous laboratory experiments since 1952. Strata don't form in the way you described. You described materials settling out vertically down, and the heavier materials settle out first, and the lighter materials at the top. That is not how sedimentary strata form. You're going to see it right before your eyes, okay? Sedimentary strata form in real time, left to right or right to left, whichever you say, horizontally. Strata do not form vertically. They form horizontally, Derek. You can see the strata growing because the water is moving rapidly, carrying and depositing the materials over a process called leading edge grain distribution. The larger pro, uh, uh, pe uh, particles settle down at the leading edge of the strata that's forming horizontally and get no to the bottom of them. The finer materials settle out at the top and the strata, uh, one strata is formed on top of the other strata in real time together in groups. Strata don't form with one slowly forming on the other. They form horizontally by leading edge grain distribution, not by vertically settling out of materials above them. That's called making a layer or a, or a varve, maybe, or a lamina, but not a layer, a, a not, not a strata. Here you can see the strata forming right before your eyes in real time. That's how sedimentary strata have been verified to form in the laboratory since the 1950s with dozens and dozens of experiments. Okay, so we know how sedimentary strata form by real, observable, testable, actual, operational science. And they form horizontally, rapidly in groups, not one strata at a time, several strata are forming at the same time, and they do so horizontally. So your explanation that the, on the ocean floors, water so materials settle downward and settle out to form strata on the ocean floor is false, scientifically invalid. No scientist believes that. They all believe what you're seeing in this video because it's been verified dozens and dozens of times by, uniform, by scientists in the laboratory. So the problem for you is since we know strata form rapidly horizontally, leading edge grain distribution, how is it that you're going to squeeze millions of years in between those strata when they have fine distinct boundaries from them, between them, which is produced rapidly right before your eyes? See, this verifies the strata of the, of the entire geologic column all the way down to the basement rock was formed by rapidly moving water. That, that form strata horizontally that, and they together in groups. So this presents a really nasty, 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 nasty problem for the uniformitarianists. They have to explain somehow how to imagine there's millions of years in between those strata. How do you do that? Okay, that what you just played, that looked exactly like how I described it happened. So I don't see... That material set downward. That's not how strata form. Yes. It, the heavier ones, of course, would be lower, of course. The lighter ones would still be mixed in the ocean, and it will settle slowly. But, of course, water is always moving. So that's how it would form horizontally. No one, no, no one claims so, it. So the entire Earth's oceans have always been moving horizontally? Uh, yes, that's what currents are. Yes, and, 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 and not only that, 
it, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to be high speeds, but yes, the currents do move at high speeds. It, well, in it has any to event, be higher than walking speed, or it's not going to form strata. Well, well, certainly. Have you ever went to the ocean and been pushed by a riptide? Yeah, the currents in the ocean not, are are rapid. Uh, no, it, not it, on it, the ocean floor. Uh, in, in general, the, the 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 water moves at at, at a very slow speed if on the ocean floor. In general, there are places where it's moving quickly, but huh. in general, across the earth, the water is moving at, at snail's pace. But if you notice, if you actually look at the various strata that you find, most of them, even though they are uh, distinct layers, they all basically look the same. You you show the picture where you actually see like very different uh, colors because there was a uh, the different material that was in there, right? Uh, those types of strata that have those different colors, the, those types strata. of strata, yes, but those well, that's not all strata. If you if, no, all if, strata have fine distinct boundaries between them, and they're clearly observable. All of yes, them. but not 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 with those uh, vibrant colors that that differentiate. No, that, that the point right. is that they have uh, clear distinct fine boundaries between them. Oftentimes, it's paper thin, thin as a piece of notebook paper. Right. Yeah. No. Okay. No. No. One How do you explain that with with slow deposition? How do you, if the strata was laid down over a period of a thousand, ten thousand, or, or so years, how does it get a fine, distinct boundary with the next yeah. one? Yeah, yeah, uh, billions, of course. And I, I believe I did so. We'll let the oh. audience decide whether I did so sufficiently, but we can move on to the next point. Mm, one of the questions that I had, for that, I, I, I gave the explanation. It wasn't no, to the satisfaction, didn't. but we'll you didn't see even try. Satisfaction. I, I did, but we'll see if this is to the satisfaction. No, of, you didn't answer my question. Audience. All right. Okay. So we'll table it for right now. We can come back to it if you want, but we should move on with it. I do have a question. How did the, the sloth make it back to South America in time? He should still be traveling now. Uh, how did, uh, an, another question, how did the koala make it to Australia uh, after he disembarked from the uh, from the ark, especially considering the fact that the only thing it eats is eucalyptus, which is okay. only found in Australia, Tasmania, and the surrounding islands. What okay. was the koala eating? So clearly, uh, and you just said, how did the, the llama make it to the Middle East? You said he just simply walked. Well, that yeah. means he would have had to walk through a land bridge. Near, Walked across a land bridge near the north now pole, under the oceans. Near, near yeah. the North Pole that is, is that is uh, in, incredibly uh, cold. I didn't know llamas was built for uh, subarctic temperatures. So apparently, it was able to go out of its climate, walk through tropics. It would have died there, and then move past that into desert, would have still survived. Then made it into, and it wasn't uh, adapted or designed to anything. That kind of animal is not suited for those environments. But somehow, it was able to make it to the Middle East and make its way back. Mm -hmm. And, no, and, and make you way back. And make its way back because after it landed in Mount Arawet, it had to make it back to South America. We don't see the remains of llamas uh, dispersed throughout uh, the path from the Middle East to South America. It had to find its way back to South America. So my question is, how did it do that? Especially the sloth that moves at such a slow pace. How did it do that? It did, it, there's not enough time on Earth for the sloth to make it from the Middle East to okay, South America. I'll answer these questions. Yeah. First off, llamas can endure very cold temperatures. They live in the uh, in the uh, uh, high in the Andes Mountains, uh, three thousand feet up, where the temperature is very cold. Okay, so they are endured for it. That's why we don't see sloths there, but we do see llamas over here uh, because the, the sloths couldn't make it. They went south instead. Okay, so they 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 walk. That's all, because uh, um, koala bears only eat eucalyptus. Well, I know that evolutionists believe eucalyptus and koalas evolved together in Australia, but that doesn't have to be so. Organisms can change their diet all the time. I remind you of the Italian wall lizard is a beautiful example of an animal that was eating plants, uh, animals, uh, organisms, and then eating plants, which are also organisms, uh, change, completely change of diet. So uh, the koala's biochemistry may have adapted over time because of they selected the, uh, uh, the, the uh, eucalyptus to eat, and now they're accustomed to it, so that's all they eat. That doesn't mean that they, that's all they can eat. That means that that's what they eat today because their biochemistry is adapted to a change in diet. How'd they get there? They walked. Okay. The problem for you is, is that we don't have any scientific evidence that the organisms evolved there because there's no fossil record showing 
koala bears coming into existence or any other animal coming into existence. I'm just not hearing any argument against the evidence I've provided for the flood of Noah. I've provided sedimentary strata which are observed to form rapidly and don't take millions of years to form. The whole geologic column is comprised of them, filled with rapidly buried creatures, cold slabs of material going deep into the earth that are far lower in temperature than the materials around them. They can't have been down there for millions of years. That's impossible. They'd be heated up to the temperature of the materials around them. I've provided scientific evidence that the earth can't be millions of years old and that the flood of the earth, uh, Noah has created the geologic column. I'm not hearing anything from you except appeals to authority, debunked tree ring, and ice core dating. You got something better? Okay, I don't need better. That's, that's, that's science. This is the same science, the same scientific method that made this conversation between us possible. Uh, I, I, know, I don't know which state you're in, but I'm in Georgia. And, but for some reason, the, the scientific method got people to a point where we, we can create technologies where we can build an internet and televisions and computers and everything else like that, where we can actually broadcast our conversation to hundreds and thousands of people. I don't know how many people are watching, hopefully thousands are uh, uh, watching. So if scientific method is good enough to do that, I'm pretty sure it's good enough to tell me how old the earth is. All right. So that's number one. Number two, uh, the whole story of the koala walking to Australia. Australia is an island. It cannot walk. Uh, to Australia. I did mention yeah. land bridges, you know. Yeah, there was no land no. bridge there. Well, uh, scientists yeah. believe there was. And in fact, that's how they believe mankind got there. Uh, yeah, no, mankind know how to build uh, uh, boats and rafts. That's well, I'm sorry to inform 80, you. 80,000 years ago. So they, they got the Eric, your, your Scientists of your own camp believe that human beings were able to walk at one point from Australia to Asia. I mean, the opposite direction. Uh, not walk, Because no, they, there were once land bridges that connected those places, just like there was once a land bridge that connected Australia, I mean, South America and uh, the Antarctic. There was a land bridge underneath the ocean. It's only, what, uh, 40 or 100 feet deep now uh, mm -hmm. that connected Af uh, uh, Asia and the United States and North America that crossed the Bering Strait. The, those land bridges are under mm -hmm. shallow seas today because the ocean water levels have been rising because the ice from the ice age has melted and right. the ocean has gone up. Absolutely. Now you understand, absolutely. Now you do understand that scientists today can and do uh, compu uh, uh, do computer simulations. It can see the rate uh, that the, the plates are moving away from each other and colliding in some areas. Uh, they can trace that back uh, first, that data is inputted into the models, and then, and then of course, the same uh, data as it relates to the receding, the receding of uh, glaciers during the last ice age. All this information is, is computed, so we know what the ocean levels were and stuff like that. And we can run the models back, and we can run the models back and see exactly where the land bridge was and where it was not based on they, the they, simulations. So now and you we know that there were land bridges, right? Uh, yes, there were, but not okay. a full, complete land bridge all the way to Australia. There was a well, land bridge in uh, the Bering straight we know that's these what things. they think. we also uh, we we use computer simulations uh based on the data that we get yearly we impute, exactly that's all we have to do that's also how we know the age of the universe well you but know you just backtracked you denied there were land bridges and no, now you're never, making up a story no, I, about I never, how scientists modeled them so now hold on hold on i, I was in the speaking so number one i never said that uh there were no land bridges i even mentioned it bearing straight so yes there were land bridges but not <laughs> one that connected one all the way. Oh, all now it's all the way. Yeah, I said that uh, humans at some point did have to, in order to make a tour Australia, had to create, uh, had to have uh, rafts and everything else like that. That that would similar to how humans got to Polynesia, how humans got to Hawaii. There's no land bridge that connect the uh, uh, the no, North America anywhere else to Hawaii. There is, and it's on the ocean floor now. It's it's no, no it's not it's the, the, the water level. Seas. The, the water was not shallow enough where people can walk to Hawaii or to the well, Polynesian how do you How do you know that? Because, uh, because the ocean because levels have risen. Because, because computer simulations. The ocean we know, levels have risen because of the end of the ice age. You understand right, that, right? We, we know that from computer simulations based on the rate that the, the, the plates are moving away. And, and we know uh, the rate that glaciers receded. So we know what the ocean levels were. That's how we know. So that's number one. Number uh, two, yeah, I, I have a question. That's true. I have another question I would, for you. I would challenge I have, your data on that. Yeah, uh, but don't challenge my data. Challenge the sciences they don't. Well, I challenge now, one, data. one one other question I have for you, sir, is uh, how is it possible 
that uh, disease that we can have acquired immunity from, how is it still around? Why is the cold still exist? How can the flu still exist? How can smallpox until very recently still exist? If all the animals were on the ship and it was only two pair and you can receive acquired immunity, if they survive to produce offsprings, that means that they were essentially immune from those and they should no longer exist. And this is the same thing for human diseases that we can gain acquired immunity from. If there was only seven human beings on a ship, then there is no way, the only way that these diseases survive is by being transmissible. So one population can uh, can become immune to it, but it spread to another population. And once it comes around and mutates enough where it can reinfect uh, the, the people who was uh, oh, originally immune mutates. to it. Uh, yes, understood. But yes. if but it has no if there's only seven people on a ship, it cannot mutate. It cannot oh, mutate. Really? Uh, we, we have acquired it immunity. Mutate. No, it's in the system of human beings. We have an acquired immunity. We will kill it. That's what the immune system is designed for. The it's only way really that fun. the only way that diseases that we can gain acquired immunity, the only way that they can survive is if they transmit out to other human beings, infect other human beings, and then it makes its way back around. We know this. We know about epidemiology. If you don't know the the study of disease, then I don't know what to tell you. But that's reality. So, Derek, here's, here's some great misunderstandings you're having. The people that were on the ark may have had viruses in them that, and had children, uh, and and they acquired immunity uh, to them before they had children. It Viruses do mutate. You just acknowledge the rebuttal to your own uh, question. Viruses can mutate. They could become, they, they could not be pathogenic in one human being. Have a mutation. We experience this with the flu all the time. That's why they have to constantly come up with new, new, uh, new uh, a a a antibodies for for the uh, vaccines. You know, yeah. For uh, vaccines. For it. hold on now. You were on the mic talking for like three minutes. And, sure, sure, sure. Okay. So, um, so, uh, uh, so they can mutate. Yes, and they could become pathogenic in a new way and be infectious and pathogenic. You haven't provided any argument from viruses except to rebut yourself when you mentioned that they can mutate. So that that's not argument. Also, viruses can be carried by animals. Animals have viruses too. Humans contract viruses from animals. Animals can get viruses from humans. See, I, I don't I don't hear any argument to there. Hear viruses, and then you rebut yourself when you mention how they can mutate and become uh, pathogenic again. It doesn't make sense. You're refuting yourself here. But well, the, the, well, the, the 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 questions I've been asking, I'm not getting an answer to, is how uh, various things that discredit uniformitarianism. Now, I want to show you something. Um, if I could screen share something on the screen. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, uh, just a, a little bit of me. I just want to take a minute, and I don't want to need a long time, just to show you a little bit of information about the Tower of Babel affair. Now, if this Tower of Babel affair is real human history, then uniformitarianism is false. Okay. So Genesis tells us Noah had three sons, Shem, Yafet, and Ham, right? Now, uh, the children of Shem were Elam, Asher, Orphex, Lud, and Aram. Now, if that's true, we should find some recorded history that Shem actually had sons named Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. Well, it do. The Semites are the offspring of Shem. They're called Shemites. That's the Semitic peoples of the world today. What about, go back, Elam was one of the sons of Shem. Okay. What about Elam? Well, Elam is one of the oldest nations in the history of the world. It's one of the oldest empires, Elam. This is from the Encyclopedia Britannica. They're also called Elamtu or Susiana. Okay. What about Asher? Go back. Asher was one of the sons of Shem. Okay. What about Asher? Well, Asher is the name of a king by the same name of the nation. Today we call it Assyria. What about Arphaxid? We should find evidence of Arphaxid and Lud. Well, here's Artaxta. This is an, another ancient historical uh, empire. And what about Lud and Aram? Ludbu, the Ludbu, the Ludamim, uh, Lydia, okay? Aram, the Aramaic language was named after him. Aram, an ancient country in the Mideast, southwestern Asia. This is from the Encyclopedia Britannica. So the Aramenian people. So we have evidence that Aram was a real human being. Now, what about the sons of, of Ham? Should we have evidence that Cush, Mizraim, Put, and, and, and Canaan were true? Well, of course we do. KMT means Kemet or Hamet in Egyptian. It's the oldest name of the land of Egypt. 
going back in history. What about Cush? Remember, son of Shem, Ham, or Cush. What about Cush? Well, there's Cush. Cush is one of the oldest empires in Africa. And what about uh, Put? Well, there's Put, Egyptian. And what about Canaan? The father of the Canaanite people, the Cana Canaanites. Uh, so we have we have plenty of evidence for that. I can do the same thing for, for Yafet and show evidence that Yafet begat the European peoples of the world. See, what we have is historical evidence that the sons of Noah produced grandsons of Noah, and the earliest empires of the world were named after the grandsons of Noah. Now, that verifies for us one important thing. That means the Tower of Nations, uh, the Tower of Babel affair described in the Bible is a human history fact. If that's a fact, and that took place only 4,500 or so years ago, then uniformitarianism isn't true, and the Bible is vindicated. And there was a flood because the flood took place only about 110 or 20 years prior to the Tower of Babel affair. So if the Tower of Babel affair took place and all of mankind migrated from Babel just 4,500 years ago, there is no millions of years. And that's what history proves to us. Because okay, we verify the oldest cultures and nations of this earth were named after Noah's sons and grandsons. How do you explain that with millions of years? Oh, that's the easiest thing to explain ever. Yeah. Uh, ever. Oh, 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 of course. I'm surprised that uh, with Japheth, you didn't mention the Ashkenaz. Uh, those were also uh, one of the children of uh, Japheth. And no, I just didn't take the time to go into uh, Japheth. There's a lot that can be said about Japheth. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, 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 and, and that's, uh, I think that's uh, ironic that the Ashkenazi Jews are uh, actually descendants of Japheth, not Shem, who was the, the original Israelite. That's a different question. Uh, uh, one thing, though, when you write down stories, there's people who are already around. So you already know these nations, and then you write the story down. So if you already know of the, the come on, uh, you already know of Kush, if you already know of uh, uh, yeah. all of these people, when you write the story down, and you write the story to say, well, what is the origin of all of these people? And you said, oh, well, the sons of these people actually came from Shem. And, and all of these people that we know of actually came from them. And all these people that we know of actually came of them. And then archaeologists later, on, oh, these people actually existed. Yeah, of course they, all, they, they existed because the people who wrote the stories down knew those people. They uh, interacted with them people. Yeah, the, the fabricated <laughs> book of Genesis theory. Right. So let's examine we know, that. We second. know. Hold on. Wait a minute. Because you had a long time. We know that the story of Genesis is fabricated. We know yeah. that the earth is not, luck, was not created in the seven days. We, of course we know that. Good luck. In the, in, in the story, we have talking snakes and talking donkeys. In the story, we have cherubims, which are flying babies with wings that fly around with magic swords. No, the Bible the doesn't tree. describe such. Uh, yes, it is. That's in no. chapter seven. Of the, yes. No, that's poetic language, Derek. Don't don't be. Oh, okay, so well, it's, you know, it's, so it's not true. <laughs> that means it's not true. I'm just going to jump in real quick because I want to be respectful to both of your times. I just reached the 55 minute mark for the discussion portion because there's a few minutes left over from your guys' uh, rebuttal rounds. I threw it into the dis discussion. I'm not saying we have to end now, but for the res respect of you guys, did you guys want to finish off addressing a few points or did you want to take some uninterrupted time to conclude your points? How would you guys like to proceed? It's up well, to I'd, I'd just like to make one comment. I'd just like to point out that if, if the Genesis account of the Tower of Babel affair was fabricated because the Jews knew of all these things, you have to explain how the Jews knew about all the European peoples. Because you, you understand the Jews didn't even have uh, inter, international com, com, uh, commerce with anybody in the today. The, the book of Genesis was written 1400 or, or so BC, 14 to 1500 BC. Okay. The Jews didn't travel the globe collecting names of nations and people in Europe and stuff in 1500 BC. It can't be that there was fabricated and they collected these names to make this story. Yeah, all they need to do is, is uh, hear names of nations, hear traveling and stuff like that. Their whole area is connected uh, across the third uh, uh, Derek, if God existed, could he make a, uh, could he make a human sounding voice come out of a snake or a donkey? Uh, no, uh, God is a material. God, God wouldn't have the power to do that. He could create the earth. No, but no, he no, make no. a donkey speak. He, he cannot create the earth either. If God is a material, immaterial things cannot uh, change material things. So if immaterial how, how do you things, know that? 
uh, because we know of immaterial things like numbers. We know of immaterial things like the words, the concepts. Concepts do not affect uh, matter. It does not affect physical things. So no, uh, God would not be able to do that. Now. So if God so. didn't e exist, he would be able to. Well, it's just a logical argument. You're trying to tell me God can't exist. That's a whole other argument. I'd be happy to debate that with you. But right. if God existed, it would be logically possible he could make anything happen, couldn't he? He could make a donkey speak if God existed, right? That's logically true, is it not? Not an immaterial one. You have to uh, okay. redefine well, God. We're, we're assuming that God exists, Derek. If you want to debate whether or not God exists, I'd mm -hmm. be happy to debate that with you another day. Uh, right. I, I, I would be happy to debate that. That's a lovely subject. But, okay. but I'm, uh, right now, I'm positing a philosophical argument for you, a logical question. If God did exist, could he not make, if he can make the earth and mankind, can he not make a donkey or a snake speak? Uh, yeah, logically, but so when, yes, right. If Allah existed, He can do that. If Vishnu existed, He can Excellent. do that. If, okay, if, thank if, you. That's so, all so, right. so, 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 yeah, thank we you. have no reason to believe that Allah, Vishnu, or Yahweh exist, uh, because so we don't say. have the evidence. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, say, I say we uh, have lots of evidence. I, 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 I would imagine that uh, a, a Muslim would say the same thing about Allah and the, and the Hindu. Yeah, and I debate them plenty. I can smash them. Too. Right. So the same type of evidence that you use to try to justify the belief in Yahweh is the same type of evidence that they use to try to justify their so, belief in Krishna. Derek, let, let's put things into perspective. You believe a cosmic dot with no space exploded and Beethoven came out of it. And you're going to mock Christian creationism. That Beethoven came out of it? No, I believe, of course, in the slow, gradual process of evolution. I know. You need your millions of yes. years to believe Beethoven arises from a cosmic dot that explodes. Well, that's what the evidence suggests. Now, if that turns right. out not to be the case, then I accept the evidence as it comes in. Right. But yeah, the evidence is that is for that, so that's what I'm going to accept. Uh, what I like about well, I, I don't believe in such myths. You know, as cosmic dots explode and space probes, computers, and information comes out of that. I'm sorry. Right, but the ones, but the individuals who's able to make those computers and spaceships and everything else like that, they do accept it overwhelmingly. That's the scientific consensus. <laughs> so those are the ones I'm going to go with because they're actually able to well, use the understanding of the, uh, the natural <clears throat> law to create new Good. technologies. Uh, the Bible hasn't given us anything that tells us anything about the natural world to create. Anything. Oh yes, it's got scientific foreknowledge. But if you want to appeal to a group of guys who believe the cosmic dot exploded and billions of years later there was space probes in Beethoven, you go right ahead. Well, I'm, I'm certainly going to believe them. They're making life-saving medications, they're extending human lifespans and everything else like that. So, yes, I'm going to accept that before I accept anything found. Uh, that ancient... The guys making age, medication uh, aren't astronomers. I, I, I didn't, no, no, they are scientists and they still use a scientific method. Uh, now, they are scientists, they still use the scientific methods. They still publish the same way in peer reviewed journals. It's the same process, yep. you know, process that just like... Can get Derek, we, we simply haven't heard any evidence for you from you as to how uniformitarianism can be true except appeals to authority. That's all I've heard tonight. And uh, appeals to radiometric dating, which I debunked. I haven't heard... Are, are, you, not, are, are you not appealing to the authority of the Bible? So aren't no, you I'm, I'm appealing to the data that science produces and what's observable, testable, and repeatable. Well, I think Such this might be a good place to, and, and to make it as fair as possible for both of you gentlemen, this has flown by. That was an hour discussion, fast paced. We touched on a number of really, really good topics and the chat's been very lively. You guys have kept it equally tied, cordial, respectful, and fun. So this has been a great debate. Why don't we do this then? We'll give you guys... A few minutes of uninterrupted time. I guess, Derek, since you started, you can go first sure. and just address whatever you want. No rush, however much time you need. Then we'll do the same you for want now. To do a little closing statement, you mean? Something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Let's okay. Go, let's, what do you need? Two minutes of peace, maybe? Something like that? What do you guys think? No, that, that, yeah, that sounds good to me. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I'm, I'm down. I'm okay, down let's do two, three minutes. We'll hand it over to Derek, then Neff, then we'll get into some questions and go from there. Go ahead, Derek. Floor is yours. All right, let me just screen share right quick. Uh, there we go. Hold on one second. Because some of the things that we didn't get to, uh, uh, also, so we can point out what, you know, all of the various uh, geological features, that those actually happen from the receding uh, glaciers during the last ice age. And of course, I have the references for that. We didn't talk to on the haplo groups. I'm surprised at that, but that's fine. Uh, here's other links. I could, uh, in, if nothing free, if you want, I can share these links with you. Uh, what I did want to do is, uh, uh, did I not have uh, all of the stories? The stories of uh, where are they at? Hold on one second. Not that. 
Because it's one I had it here, the various, uh, uh, hold on one second. Uh, I got to, where is it at? The, da, 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 da. Oh, no, no. Where is it at? Oops. It looks like I don't have. Okay, yeah. These are all the various flood myths from around the world. These are all the various flood myths from around the world. And a brief synopsis of what they say in it. If you actually look at all these various flood myths, you can see that all of them are different. All of them are, and most of them, you know, especially the ones that next to the islands, they talk of tsunamis. They don't talk about the rains coming down and the oceans rising from the ground. So, yes, there's stories about the flood all over the world, but they're all different and desperate. And then on top of that, uh, the amount of people who survived and everything else like that is different. In some cases, the flood didn't kill it. You know, everybody, whole, whole group survived and stuff like that. Sometimes the flood uh, started and then it, it, it didn't actually cover all the lands. All these people have different stories. So the reason why, why is all these stories different if the biblical account is correct? And of course, before the Bible was written down, they had to go through an oral tradition. So it would be as uh, uh, corrupted as all these other stories if that would be the claim for why these are so di uh, different. Right. On top of that, we actually know of pre-biblical uh, flood accounts in the Sumerians, uh, uh, in the Babylonians, and so on and so forth from around the time. And that's where those two those two different uh, versions of the uh, of the flood story that's in those same chapters. One with only two of every animal, and then one with seven of the uh, clean, and only two of the unclean. Those stories already exist. We know about the Epic of Gilgamesh. We know about the various other Sumerian flood narratives. We know about the Babylonian flood narrative. This is in the Middle East. Those Hebrews during the time had access to that so they can see that. So let me just close with this. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. OK. To this day, we have thousands of stories and miracles from all types of religious texts and people all over the world, Christians, and otherwise the flood would have to be a miracle. We were already broken down why that would be the case. To this day, we have discovered not one scientifically, uh, verif uh, no scientifically confirmed case of any actual miracles of any kind. Uh, so do these miracles no longer take place and why not? Now, according to the laws of physics, as we know them, the very laws that have given the people the power to create technology, this is the one that allows to broadcast over the internet, miracles cannot happen. Neither in the past, neither in the present, neither in the future. It cannot happen. All right. And then uh, I actually spoke about this. I was I didn't have enough time in opening, and I would have liked to go back and forth with this. But immaterial things cannot physically interact with physical things. Moving, changing, or altering a physical thing or system requires that the thing or the system be interacted with physically. Nothing was ever moved, changed, or altered by an immaterial thing. You cannot defeat this argument. I would like to see you try. Uh, animals are physical things. Water consists of physical things. Talking to an influencing person is a physical process. God is defined as an immaterial thing. Let's refer back to argument one. God did not move the animals, cause a flow to physically interact with Noah. God does not exist physically. The concept of God exists only in the minds of humans. Uh, and then... Uh, so in conclusion, so the Noah story in the, in the Bible is a legend based on an actual flesh, certainly, or several that the Hebrews or surrounding people's experience is not to be taken literally. Creationists who are biblical literates want to preserve the story because if anything in the Bible is proved to be false, even though you mentioned the fact that sometimes the allegories is used or uh, poetic language, which means it's not to be taken literal, then what can we say is true? Is there a heaven or a hell? Is Jesus the Son of God? Does Jesus exist? Does God even exist? If not, what is the meaning of life and how am I supposed to live a good life? I, you know, I didn't come and answer any of these questions. And to be frank, if you believe any of that stuff, I'm happy for you. But the reality is that that does not prove the truth of the biblical flood. Just doesn't happen. For 2,000 years, Christians have been living in fear of the supernatural, demons, devils, hellfire, ghosts, Armageddon, human nature, God's wrath. For 2,000 years, it, it, just like the people who were listening to Jesus' speech, he thought that the Armageddon would come in their lifetime. Didn't happen. The chance of some Armageddon coming in your lifetime, not going to happen. You don't need to be afraid of that. You need to free yourself from the fear of these fables, take control of your life, and make the world a better one. Don't wait for some afterlife, which very likely does not exist. I'll conclude with that. All right. Thank you so much for that concluding statement there, Derek. That was between four and five minutes, roughly. Uh, therefore, Neff. Uh, take the same amount of time. Um, just take your time, guys. Uh, okay. Go ahead now. Um, I'd like to screen share as well. So, Derek, what I what I heard is um, you moved from uniformitarianism to trying to disprove the Bible and trying to disprove the existence of God. I understand you're a God denialist. 
that's not an argument for uniformitarianism. It doesn't help you one bit. Um, miracles happen every day. I've seen miracles happen right before my very eyes. I've seen a woman healed of an incurable neurological disease instantaneously with the laying on of hands and prayer. Miracles happen every single day. Now, I, want, I just want to show, um, I, I can see that you don't want to believe the flood because if the flood is true, then your whole world crumbles. And this is why you turn on an argument against the existence of God, which I'd be happy to, to demonstrate for you is, is the logical conclusion in another debate. Um, I, I would uh, welcome a debate about the existence of God. What you're looking at is the Navajo sandstone formation in the American Southwest. At the very top, you see a massive formation all laid down by a single deposition. How do we know? Because the boundary of it is at the bottom. Then on top below that is another massive deposit of sand below that. But then below it is numerous sedimentary strata going down inside the earth. So if the strata below at the bottom on top of which these massive sandstone formations are resting were formed over millions of years, why are we to believe that only one material such as sand was later, at some point in, human, in Earth's history, the only material available for deposition over 500,000 square miles of the 400,000 square miles of area for millions and millions of years. And then another event, which laid down almost pure sand for millions and millions and millions of years. You see, to believe this, you have to believe that the Earth deposited sand from one place on the Earth to this location and dumped it there, leaving pure, nearly perfectly pure sand for just mi for millions of years. Is that logical? No, it's not logical. That sand would be littered with all kinds of things, all kinds of other materials. Wouldn't be nearly pure. And it's irrational to believe there is a wind or water pattern on the earth that lasts for millions upon millions upon millions of years so that only sand is moved from this location on the earth miles and miles away to that one and dumped in nice and neatly in one gigantic area. That's absurd. Uniformitarianism is absurdity. If those strata going deep into the earth below those massive sand formations were or are, represent millions of years, then the sand depositions above them, which are even more massive, also represent millions of years. But to believe that only sand would be deposited by the earth in this location, moved from somewhere else and dumped here, just sand, for millions of years, is irrational. It cannot be true. But if that material was deposited there from the Appalachian Mountains area during the flood of Noah by massive currents of water, then we have a logical explanation for it. And that's exactly what secular scientists believe, that that material came there, but by wind. And that can't even be true. It had to be water that did it. Because it possesses folded, uh, uh, it possesses fossils and recumbent folds. I love this picture. I just want to show this picture and I'm going to end with it. Can you explain to us how boulders go rolling and dashing across the surface of the earth, boulders as big as a city block? slamming into mountains with uniformitarian time. I don't know about you, but I don't believe that boulders that weigh 12 million tons go bouncing across the surface of the earth today or ever did. But if there was a column of water 300 feet deep moving at 140 miles per hour, I can see why a boulder the size of a building would go bouncing across the earth if it were pushed by water, because water can exert an enormous inner force upon something. So that hole in the side of a mountain is big enough you could build numerous houses inside of it. At least four full-size two-story houses could be built inside that hole. That's the side of a mountain now. Look at the scale with trees in foreground. That hole is nearly three-quarters of a mile away, and look how big it is. A tree, a hundred foot pine tree, would not reach from the bottom of that thing to the top of it. You see the trees on the side of the mountain. Let me show you those trees. Let's zoom in a little. You see how big those trees are? These are trees up here. How they would fit in there, one stacked upon the other. 
that's multiple stories tall. That's a single, single hole impact mark in the side of a mountain. That cannot be true if uniformitarianism is true. This one photograph you're looking at right now is proof that the Noahic flood is a geological fact because it's a scientific fact that multiple thousand ton boulders don't go bouncing across the surface of the earth in the air. They might do it underwater that's moving at 100 plus miles per hour, but not across the air, ground in the air. So uh, I, that, that concludes my, my, uh, uh, my statements. I'll just say, I didn't hear any scientific evidence for uniformitarianism. I heard a lot of a denialism and made up stories. Okay. Can, I, can uh, I make one statement right quick, uh, Senator for Truth? Sure, yeah, if, if Neff's okay with that, go ahead. Why not? Yeah. Why not? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we know that- Make uh, up another story, Derek. Well, well, no, we know that during the last ice age, we had a uh, uh, receding of uh, glaciers. If uh, boulders can uproot, uh, glaciers can uproot boulders. Uh, as uh, glaciers break, a uh, boulder can roll down the glacier at rapid speed and hit them. A boulder and the size of a building can be moving at 100 plus miles per hour across the landscape. Yeah, it can roll down a glacier that 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 shifted, uh, and then of course, as uh, uh, glaciers grow and recede throughout that season, or the ice age. How does a hundred? How does a thousand so the boulder, ton boulder How the does boulder a thousand now? ton boulder get on top of the glacier, Derek? Uh, it can uproot it. So yeah, so it's uh, glaciers, glaciers swallow break. boulders. They don't uproot them. Uh, yeah, they swallow yeah. them. Yeah, as it recedes, it can turn it up to the top and it can roll down. No, they, they sink in the ice. They go to the bottom. They don't go up. Uh, no, they don't necessarily Yes, sink they always do. If if you drop a rock that weighs 10 pounds on top of a glacier and come back 20 years later, it's down inside the glacier. Uh, yeah, that's if you drop it. If you just have the ice moving and you and the glaciers is, is you're uh, believing in receding and going forward, it's receding and going forward. But you believe water can though. So uh, I, I can see sorry. ice doing it. I can see uh, uh, a solid thousand ice ton boulder. It's not going to be spat upwards by a glacier over any amount of time. That thing is going to sink through the ice. Uh, it's not going to break up through the ice. Uh, it's some ice go down to the bottom of the ice. Some ice will get compacted by it, uh, but ice is very uh, structurally, uh, structurally sound. So no, yes. ice, ice is soft. It's plastic. A rock will sink into ice over time. You need to look into that. Uh, do, do do you not see uh, glaciers in the North Pole and in, in Antarctica? <clears throat> you see that? I'm sorry, but a, a multiple, uh, you know, a, a couple thousand ton boulder is not going to come upwards. Out from the bottom of the glacier, it, the it, it can be turned up in the glacier. It's, it's impossible. And not only that, but then the, the the boulder would still be there. The 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 growing and receding of the glacier actually carried the boulder away again after it made the impact. So 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 yes, that's easily explained uh, by the recession of glaciers during the last ice age. Yes. Okay. Bizarre. All right. Looks like we had a, a second mini debate there. I like how you guys keep it fun and engaging. We probably could debate this topic all night, to be honest with you. Um, two hours has flown by. So, you know, what? we've got some good questions all pertaining to the topic. So if you guys want to have a brief back and forth on each on, on specific questions, of course, feel free to I'll make this one easy going. Uh, just try and make sure that whoever the question is for, maybe just uh, give them the last word. Um, so we can get through as many as possible. Okay, guys. So let's get um, let's get started. I'm just going to start with um, the first question that came in, and I'll read them word for word, and we'll just go from there. So first question that came in was from David P. Neff. Let me see here. Question for Nephilim Free. So question for you. He asks, uh, "Are you a geocentrist?" No, I am not. Okay. He, I believe he, that the. I believe the Milky Way is the center of the galaxy universe or close to it. I don't believe the Earth is. You can call that, as far as you're concerned, that's probably geocentrism. But I believe what the scriptures say when the Earth was created first and the heavens created afterward. And I believe Russell Humphreys has a good explanation for this. It's called time dilation. I believe God expanded the universe away from the Earth. The earth was created first, just like scripture says. So the, or the, the earth was the cent direct center of the universe, but I believe our galaxy is at the center of the universe. I prefer to say it that way. But I don't believe the earth is at the center of our solar system. So the earth was created before the sun? Yes. 
Okay, I, I'm not even going to respond to that. Uh, we can we can take the next question. Okay, let's go to the next question. Thanks for the answer there, Neff. Uh, uh, super chat from Jungle Jargon, $5. Thank you so much, JJ. I appreciate it. Question is for Derek this time. Derek, can you tell me uh, what the volume of the flood sediment layers is around the globe? If, if some of these questions are too specific, that's fine. You don't have to. Uh, that one seemed like kind of a specific one. Yeah, you want the, the the exact number? I don't know the exact number. Yeah, no, I don't think any of us are on, on the top of our head. Um, do you want to elaborate at all, or I, I think Nephilim Free mentioned like eighteen thousand feet or something like that. But not, I, I don't know the number. Eighteen hundred feet to six miles, depending. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The average is I'm I'm happy with that. I don't need to receive that. Okay, let's. Uh, okay, so question here. I think this will lead to some decent dialogue. We've got Atheist Junior. Question. So what's good is we got a good uh, number of questions for both of you. So we'll go. Um, th th now this one's going to be for Neff. So Atheist Junior asks: uh, Limestone forms by ocean organisms with calcium carbonate shells dying, and the shells falling to the sea floor and compacting over millions of years. Neff, how could this happen during the flood time span? Okay, two things. Firstly, it's not been verified that calcium carbonate in, that, that comprises limestone was, in fact, uh, uh, coccolithophores. Uh, it, it's just calcium, calcium carbonate. Uh, it may be that uh, uh, some percentage of, of, of uh, limestone actually was. But that could be explained by uh, massive uh, plumes of coccolithophores dying because of the changed environment in the oceans because of the caused by the flood. Uh, but the problem for the uniformitarians is this. We find fossils and including dinosaur fossils in chalk and limestone. That if that material formed over vast ages of time by uniformitarian time, which is one to two inches per thousand years, one to two centimeters per thousand years, it would be impossible for there to be a fossil in limestone because the materials, the animal would simply dissolve in the water. Salt water would simply dissolve the bones. It would turn to dust. And scavengers on the ocean floor by the millions, ocean worms, would devour every bit of it. You wouldn't have to just cover the, the organism with enough calcium carbonate to cover the animal. You would have to cover it with numerous feet of calcium carbonate so that when it's compacted, it squeezes all the water out, becomes dense to protect the organism from scavengers and the action of the uh, saline water of the seas. That means you need six feet or more of calcium carbonate being deposited on an animal and compacted before the animal can be devoured by scavengers or the seawater can dissolve it. You got a hard thing to explain there. Uh, actually, that's not uh, really hard to explain, especially considering the fact how few human uh, 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 fossils there are, or mummified humans there are. Uh, fossilization is a very arduous process. It usually does not occur. It only it, it, the, the percentage of organisms that actually get fossilized is so minute, yet we have hundreds of thousands of, of, of fossilized remains. How does this happen? Because we had a long period of time for those unique circumstances to actually take place. So yeah, there are going to be small occasions where the fossilization process can take place and it won't be divided by the environment. That's why we have so many fossils, especially considering the fact how difficult it is for fossils to form in the first place. So, so yes. Yeah, so, so you mentioned two things. The absence of human fossils is a problem for uniformitarianists, not creationists, okay? Not the flood. That's oh, a problem for your camp. Place. Now, I get the last word. Next Sorry. time you get the last word, right? The question for you, you get the last word. Uh, that, that's a problem for your camp, not for mine. If humans have been around hundreds of thousands of years, there should be uh, countless uh, tons of th many, many, many thousands of human fossils. There aren't. That's the problem for you, not for me. Um, so also uh, the idea that the calcium carbonate is going to build up at such a ridiculously slow rate to bury an organism and preserve it from scavengers and from the uh, acidic pH water of the oceans uh, to a depth that will will at the rate it's believed by uniformitarianists to form is impossible. It cannot have formed that way. So 
calcium, the limestones and the chalks of the earth cannot have formed over a vast period of time. Uniformitarianism is false. You got the last word. Okay, gentlemen, I appreciate that back and forth, keeping it fun. So let's go. Next question. Uh, I'll find one now for Derek. Um, okay, Mitchell, $5 super chat. Thank you so much, Mitchell. Question is for Derek. If the global flood did not happen, can you explain why I find seashells in limestone here in Colorado? Uh, because of plate tectonics. We know that uh, the ocean floor... I mean, the, the ground that we work on was used to be submerged under the ocean. There are areas in the earth that uh, sublimate where areas go underneath uh, and then go, get reincorporated into the mantle and fresh land is being pushed out. So all the land that we're working on right now used to be under an, under the ocean. That's why you see seashells on it. Thank you for that response there, Derek. Neff, did you have a response at all to that one? Yeah, well, just to say that uh, the reason that uh, all the um, earth that we know of was under the ocean is because there was a flood. Yeah, no, it's not because it's a flood. It's because the continents are being pushed away, and we can simulate the rate that the, the continents are being pushed away in the areas where they're submerging back into the mantle, and we know that... Uh, the, uh, the land that was under the Pacific, uh, and mind you, the, even the oceans was different based on plate tectonics and the way things move. Of course, lands were pushed together at some point. We've all heard of Pangea. We've heard of uh, Ghana, Wanda. Uh, we want to know exactly why. Like, you know, a good question would have been like, why would you find various uh, ancient remains of uh, like uh, the precursors to like modern day animals, like, uh, you know, like old versions of horses and old versions of stuff like that in areas outside of their native origin where we know they're from is because these, these lands was pushed together during the time uh, that these earlier forms of species was emerging and they were able to then freely move around before it was separated mostly into islands. So for the most part, uh, uh, South America is primarily mostly an island except for that small area of the Panama Canal. Uh, North America, essentially, uh, island, Australia, clearly is an island, and so on and so forth. There wasn't a case, uh, uh, you, if you look at a map, clearly South America used to fit into West Africa. Uh, there's no question about this, and, and that's based on plate tectonics. All right, awesome, guys. Okay, next question is from, let's see here, Smokey Saint asks, question for Derek. If the narrative in the Bible was talking about a local Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian flood as Noah saw it naturalistically from his perspective, would you then believe the tale? Uh, well, well, not necessarily. I, I would assume that, uh, yes, uh, people during that time, during the time where Noah was described as being alive, that they did witness a local flood. Uh, but the idea that animals came to the Middle East and all boarded a, a boat and uh, all the human beings came from Noah's sons, and stuff, that's still too fantastic. Now, don't don't take anything away. You know, you don't necessarily have to take this stuff literally. You can look at it as a story of saying God's dissatisfaction with the way human beings were behaving, a tale of, of retribution and, and then uh, redemption with the covenant that came afterwards. So you can see a good message in the story. It's also a good message because it ties all the human beings together, even though we are tied together, but that's not how. But it does have a message to tie all human beings together, and that's good. That's you know, so you can look at the wisdom of the story and, and, and accept that. Uh, but uh, but no, uh, the, the first five books of the Bible Genesis, Exodus, and so on it was supposedly written by Moses, who and it wasn't Moses speaks of his own death in uh, what was it, Deuteronomy or something like that. So he speaks of his own death. So he didn't write it. But it is believed that a thousand years after uh, Noah, quote unquote, existed, uh, the story was written down. So clearly, especially considering the fact that we have pre biblical sources of, of the flood story that are different. Clearly, this story is not uh, the case, but definitely it, it did come from uh, a real experience with uh, actual catastrophic flood. Uh, that people in the Middle East experience and people all over the world experience. 
My response is, the evidence is that the flood was global and catastrophic. The list of evidences for the Noahic flood is highly extensive. For me to elucidate all of it would take a weekend uh, of nonstop talking, and uh, or more, maybe three, four days. Uh, the the uh, the only evidence we have is that Moses wrote the New Testament. Uh, the uh, is the, uh, the Genesis account. Uh, it's possible that someone named Gad and maybe another author also co-authored it, but that's not an argument for anything. Uh, we have powerful evidence that Moses wrote it. All the prophets of the Old Testament attribute Moses as the author and the giver of the law. Okay. Uh, all, since I get the last word, the uh, the overwhelming evidence that you said you you, you can use to, to prove the uh, the global flood is true. Uh, the vast majority of people in America are Christians. I'm pretty sure they would like to hear that. Uh, how the vast majority of Christians in America uh, do not accept the flood story to be literally true. Uh, only 24 percent of the American population accept the literal interpretation of the Bible. Uh, the other 47 percent of who are Christians uh, of Americans uh, do not, you know, so they still are Christians. They still uh, accept the wisdom found in the Bible. They still believe in God and Jesus and everything else like that. They still trying to be good people, still trying to make it to heaven, but they don't accept the biblical story. And I, I see no reason why they would not if all of this overwhelming evidence that you say existed exists. Awesome. You guys are rocking this q and I like it. So let's see. Uh, next one is a $5 super chat from George Bond. Thank you, George. Question for Derek. He says, limestone layers extend from England to Europe to the Middle East to North America and Australia and all around the same location in the geological column. How do you best explain that? Go ahead, Derek. Uh, very simply, uh, Keep in mind, uh, limestone is another type of sedimentary stone. All sedimentary, uh, all essentially saying it's called sedimentary because it's, 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 you know, it's particulate, right? So all you have to do is be in an area where there's a bunch of shell creatures. Uh, the ocean, of course, will wash over the shells and grind it down until it makes those limestone and calcium deposits. And those are the stuff, that's the source material from which that local area will then stack on layers, uh, a sedimentary layer. So that's, that's, that's how it works. So all you need to be is in an area that has these, uh, these animals. The, the ocean will grind it up. It will be sedimentary, meaning uh, like a sedimentary mixture in chemistry. It'll be in the liquid eventually. It it will settle, and and, and it, because of the same density, it, it'll settle more or less uniformly. In that case, I'm using uniform in a different uh, different manner, but of course, because these are the same type of densities, once it grinds down, when it does lay down, uh, that's how they can form in layers like that. So that's how that's explained. Mm. Same density. I, I don't I don't understand. I'm not sure you know what you're talking about. Uh, the, the 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 problem is how do you get limestone how do you get calcium carbonate to deposit in one particular area over millions of years and be so pure that's one of the problems uh, because if limestone were laid down over millions of years it couldn't be so pure it'd be impossible it'd have all kinds of garbage in it secondly um, you, you can't get calcium carbonate to deposit at a rate of two centimeters per one to two centimeters per thousand years and have any fossils in it. None. There could be none. It's impossible because the organism would be devoured by ocean worms and it would be uh, dissolved by the ocean, the, the acidic ocean waters in only a few thousand years, maybe a couple of decades. Uh, a whale, an entire whale, falls dead on the ocean floor. It's completely devoured every scrap of bone in one year. Gone. So it's impossible to have a fossil in limestone if it were formed over uniformitarian time, and yet we have them, even dinosaur fossils. Yeah, all a dinosaur have to do is fall into a, a lake or, or, or in, well, not in the ocean, it'd be in a lake. That's where these uh, limestone deposits usually form. All it has to do is, is fall in the bottom of that thing, get swept over by some more limestone, and it's essentially protected. It, it, and that limestone isn't yet compacted enough where it can actually form those uh, those hard layers that we see. So it, it, that's not hard to explain either. Uh, and of course, a biblical flood would not create uh, limestone as uniform as we see it. Uh, why would one violent event that took place and where the, the it, it didn't recede in a year 
uh, layer all those deposits. When you said those those, those paper layer uh, sedimentary, it wouldn't take place in a year's time. Clearly, that that's the result of many, 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 many seasons of changing climate conditions. All right. Awesome, guys. So next question, another super chat from Jungle Jargon. Thank you so much. Question is for Derek. Derek, uh, question is, are you aware of the six mega sequences that make up the sediment layers? Uh, no. Okay, no problem. Why don't we yeah. just... Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't necessarily study uh, geology specifically. I got the the, the rough ideas. I, I, you know, but as far as getting all the specifics of this and stuff like that, you know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm a student. So no I'm problem. No problem. Yeah. I think the question yeah, pertains to uh, uh, global uh, uh, strata formations. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they're called mega sequences, and they span the continents, verifying the continents were all underwater at the same time, not in different pieces, as uniformitarianists falsely claim. That's what I think they're pointing to, these mega sequences which span the continents. In other words, the chalk formations of Dover, England, are also found in the middle of Kansas, and they're found in Australia, and they're found in Asia, verifying that those materials were deposited during a catastrophic event that covered all those continents at the same time. Do, do you know the six... Uh that he was talking about uh, the Caucasian, the uh, mega, the uh, the uh, Arasoka. Uh, I can't remember the name, something off the top of my head. I have a list, okay. No. And it, it, quick question uh, if it happened in one flood, wouldn't that be uniform? Why are you uh, naming areas in desperate locations that's uh, far removed from each other? Because it was the, the flood was global. Yes, un un understandable, but wouldn't it then be uniformly laid out? No, catastrophic events can explain massive amounts of material deposited rapidly. Uniformitarianism cannot. Well, wouldn't uniformitarianism just say that if you have similar conditions in different locations and similar events in different locations, that similar uh, geological structures could form? Not in massive quantities of limestone, chalk, or, or sandstone. It's impossible to get nearly pure stuff like that with fossils in it under uniformitarian time. It can't well, happen over millions of years. Well, it can't be that pure if it has fossils in it. Well, and what I mean by nearly pure is sandstone is predominantly sand. There's relatively little of anything else in it. And that right. just couldn't be if it were deposited over a vast age of time. Right. Well, you know, there's different types of sand. Uh, sand is made by pulverizing rocks that's usually near uh, a beach as the waves lap up. It, it grinds it down. And that's what causes sand to begin with. I disagree. Uh, that that isn't what. So how is sand made? Uh, I sedimentary believe this, rock is, is pulverized igneous rock. No, I, I believe the sand was 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 uh, uh, silicates that were inside the earth. And when the earth exploded and God opened the fountains of the great deep, ma the uh, tremendous force caused uh, this material inside the earth to come out in the form of crystals. And you have massive amounts of sand exploding from inside the earth and flowing out across the seas. That's where I believe the sand came from. Uh, you, 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 there is a process of that too, of course, but uh, the sand that you find on the beach is, of course, pulverizing this rock. It's calcium. It's uh, silicate. It's a particular type of material. Yes, yeah, silicate. Be, silicate yeah, is found in igneous rock. Mm -hmm. And it and it, uh, it it's been transported over vast distances as well. All right, I forgot who questioned this, so I don't know who gets the last word. But <laughs> was, no problem. It was, it was your question, Derek. Oh, Take okay, a okay. moment. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 that, 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 no. That's fine. We can, we can, we can move on. No, you guys have done great. It's been a good Q and A, a great debate. So we only got a couple questions left here. We'll um, we'll race through these ones, and then we can call it a night since we've been going two and a half hours. So you guys have been great. I appreciate your time. Um, this question is kind of for both of you. It's from SFB Mod in the chat. Um, so you both can comment on it if you, if you know anything about this specific discovery. So question is, does the Ringwoodite discovery give an explanation for where the global floodwaters have receded? 
if you guys are familiar with that discovery, you can have you can comment on it. Well, ring the ring uh, possesses a tremendous amount of water trapped inside it, deep in the earth, and uh, it just verifies that there's an awful lot of water inside the earth. Uh, if the earth formed by accretion and was once a glowing hot ball of water, the uniformitarianists can't explain massive amounts of water inside the earth because it wouldn't be there inside lava, so how to get down in there. The gravity of the earth com would compact, as the earth formed, would compact the materials of the earth so in such a way that water couldn't seep deep down into it and get there. The only way that water could be inside the earth is if the Lord created the earth and he created it with water in inside it for a purpose. Under uniformitarian uh, uh, formation of the planet, you couldn't have massive amounts of water inside the earth. They believe massive amounts of water have been subducted with the plates that slide under each other, dragging water down into the earth. But that couldn't possibly explain the massive amounts of water in the earth or trapped in ringwoodite. Okay. Uh, when it comes to uh, ringwoodite, it's... Could it, it theoretically can hold a ton of water, but we don't know if it actually has a ton of water, especially considering how deep it is and how hot it is. That water would be gas and it would escape. Uh, so that's one thing. That's so, uh, right. Uh, one other thing is we know uh, based on the accretion disk and, and uh, in, uh, understanding how the earth formed uh, that there was water. Uh, that was, and of course, everything settled. So the heavier materials, even in you know, a molten earth, that's why you have all the iron and stuff like that that's in the core. That's the heaviest stuff that goes down to the bottom in the mantle. You have uh, uh, the silicates and stuff like that in the mantle because that's uh, the next one up. And then uh, we know how the crust forms and, and everything else like that. During this whole time, there was a uh, comic bombardment. So initially, as the earth solidified, you did have water that was uh, in the in the. Uh, interior of the earth, but of course, those lighter hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms rose to the surface uh, through various mechanisms, through uh, 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 volcanoes and everything else like that, that releases the steam up and out. And that's why the lighter stuff is on the top, uh, the, the middle stuff is in the middle, and the heavy stuff like the iron primarily is at the core because the earth is molten, and this is where those areas got to. So. Uh, there you have it. Uh, if you know anything about geothermal energy, you know, if you get so far, th this is the reason why geothermal energy works. And you don't even have to go that far deep into the earth uh, where water would actually turn into steam. And that's what we use to uh, turn uh, turbines and uh, geothermal power generators, uh, power plants. So, yeah. So water just can't exist that deep in the earth as water. It would be steam and it would be it would it'd come up it'd bubble up to the surface. Great point. All right, so let me see. La, next question here is, and, and great answers there, gentlemen. Um, let me see if I've got any more lingering around. Uh, nope, ask that one. I think I might have got them all. There's one here that kind of just came in. Let me see here. I'll put it up on screen. The last two that just came in, I'll put up on screen. The other ones I saved from a while ago. So let me just find it. Gentlemen, bear with me. Okay, so this one is from Heaven. It's up on the screen. Question to Neff. What is the best proof? So I guess if you just had to pick one um, for the flood that we got. Well, I think the, the most obvious uh, evidence of the flood is the fact that the continents are covered by a very deep sedimentary strata which have uh, fine distinct boundaries between each other. One ab abruptly ends on top of the other one. That couldn't simply be formed. It's impossible for that to form by uniformitarian time. Instead, you would see a gradation of materials, one uh, uh, gradiating into the other as one becomes more available and one less available for deposition over time. The fact that the boundaries uh, of the sedimentary strata, the vast majority of them are clear, distinct, and very fine, and the particle size distribution is a product of a property of them, the majority of them. And the fact that they are littered with rapidly buried creatures is verification, uh, hands down, that the entire geologic column was formed by sedimentary uh, action during a catas 
cosmic flood. It's simply impossible to get a geologic column of sedimentary strata going deep into the earth with fine distinct boundaries, particle size distribution, littered with rapidly buried creatures, which had to be buried quickly to be preserved or you wouldn't have a fossil unless the flood of Noah was a scientific fact. Uh, the one question I would ask is, uh, especially considering the fact that uh, we have all of these fossils in those various layers, a lot of them, especially if you look at the Cambrian explosion, you would see that uh, if Noah took two of every creature with him, then where are all these creatures now? So did in they the ocean all die extinct? So they just they, they all just went extinct in the last four thousand years. Uh, Noah didn't have to take uh, 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 um, marine animals with him on the ark; they remained in the sea. He had to take land animals with him. He didn't have to take any creatures that live in the water. Even if we look at the fossils of land animals that are found in these various layers, because for example, I mentioned the explained by a flood. So, so what you're saying is that. Uh, one of the examples I gave was like the horse. So we know of uh, where horses came from. It came from uh, not hoofed animals, but animals that actually had toes uh, and, you know, had feet and toes. So we have a whole chain of fossils that lead up uh, anatomically, essentially, to the modern horse as we have it uh, today with the hoof. Uh, so you, you're saying, so did Moses, I'm, excuse me, did Noah have each one of these incarnations on 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 the boat or or no? He, uh, he yes. So uh, the idea that we have a sediment that we have fossils that verify uh, that verify uh, uh, the evolution of horses is is nonsense. I'm gonna screen share something real quick. It won't take but a moment. Give me okay. give me sixty seconds on the mic. I'll show you something. The 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 creatures that are allegedly one evolved into another from the horses kind. Uh, have been discovered to be coexisting. Here's some scientific evidence for that. Okay, even secular scientists now acknowledge these creatures coexisted with each other, which means one didn't evolve into the other. Dr. Niles Eldridge, the famous scientist, uh, once uh, curator of the American Natural History Museum, he, he says right here, an awful lot of false information has gotten into textbooks, he, and, he, and he points to the fossils, the series of alleged horse evolution on display in his own museum. He says, we've known it's bunk for 50 years but they still keep putting these displays in our museums. So the science, the idea was a good one that horses evolved. If you believe in evolution, it's been debunked by two things. Uh, one, uh, there isn't any transitional fossils to horses. And secondly, two, the creatures claimed to be transitions are, were, are now known to have coexisted with each other because they've been found in the same strata, the same formation. And if they coexisted, that means you don't have any evidence that one existed prior to the other, so you have no reason to believe one evolved into the other. Right, right quick, I know you get the last word, but uh, no one said that these things cannot ex coexist and still have a common origin with something. So if we believe, for example, that but dog... That doesn't provide evidence that one evolved into the other if they coexisted. Well, we have... It throws a massive wrench into the idea. So you can't look at the fossils and say, we can look at them and show that one evolved into the next. You can't do that if they live together. Well, genetically, we know today that... You can believe it, maybe, but you don't have any scientific reason for believing it. It's just a belief, not a scientific thing. Yeah, right quick, uh, Nephilim Free. We know uh, from the examples of dogs that they came from wolves. They came from wolves. Wolves, wolves are, are dogs. Wolves are not dogs. They're yeah, different. You species. might as well say they are. They're, they're, they're the same type of animal. And the horses and the fossils you talk about uh, believe uh, evolved. One evolved into an, another is the mixing of two kinds of creatures. One is a horse kind and one is not a horse kind. And evolutionists line them up next to each other and say, look, this kind became that kind. But we just don't have evidence of that. We know they coexisted. That's what we know today. Okay, uh, you just just look at the evolution. One one scientist saying something that goes against. I have it. looked at it. That's why I found out something about horse evolution and fossils you didn't know about. That they have coexisted with each other, and even Niles Eldridge, the famous evolutionist, staunch evolutionist, admits that the displays about horse evolution put in museums are bunk, and they we've known it. Scientists have known it for fifty years.
we, we already know in evolution that uh, that uh, creatures can coexist even if they share a common ancestor. Well, that's your we belief. Know, that's no, 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 evidence no, doesn't show it if we, they coexist. We, we know for a fact that there's three different species of zebra. Uh, we can imagine with all different numbers of chromosomes. That's a horse each, kind of animal. That's a horse. That's all it is. A variety of the same it, type it, of animal. Yeah, it, it's there's not no anatomical difference between a zebra and and a, and a pony at a pony show. There's morphological difference, no anatomical difference. They're the same kind of animal, just producing varieties. That's not evidence of evolution. That's evidence of adaptation and variety, which doesn't support evolution. There's genetic difference. Uh, uh, that's genetic the difference by itself is not evidence of evolution. Uh, sure, it is. In, as a matter of fact, in, in your imagination, we see a whole uh, we, we see a whole different number of chromosomes. It just as in any evidence, and, horses. And, and, oh, that's all. And, and on top of that, uh, I would just mention the zebras. So clearly, zebras are the horse not, kind. Uh, we can call it a horse kind, but a horse right, is a because species. that's what it is. And as a matter of fact, well, naming uh, it a different species doesn't make evolution true, and it doesn't show fossil evidence that one evolved into the other, and it doesn't demonstrate anatomical change from one type of creature into another. It's so zebra is basically a horse. That's all it is. It's a variety of horse. And we could point to the donkey as well. So yes, the donkey, the zebra, and the horse. horse. Yep, and they all exist simultaneously, and they all have a common origin. Creatures are able to produce considerable variety of themselves, but they don't evolve. Uh, of course, one, one kind of creature doesn't beget a fundamentally different type over time. That's scientifically impossible. Uh, uh, how it's do you? It's genetically impossible. How, how could you possibly say it's scientifically impossible when all uh, the science is That's very possible. I give you an hour of my time sometime. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. You guys are <laughs> yeah. funny. Hey, it looks like we got a bonus debate at the end here. Yeah, it's right. A sneak, peek, <laughs> a sneak peek into a future evolution debate between you guys. So I got to say, it's, it's going on two hours and 40 minutes. You guys have... Wow. Amazing so stamina, yeah, wow. amazing yeah. endurance. <laughs> uh, let me plug. Uh, logical, plausible, uh, probable is having an after show immediately after this. I'm going to yeah, be in that, and, and uh, so check that out too. Yeah, anybody's welcome. Of course, the debaters too. I know you guys just went for two hours and forty minutes. So, <laughs> but, but Derek, even yourself, you are invited, of course. So yeah, you guys. Uh, that was a, that was an awesome debate. Uh, really good topic. You guys kept it engaging in the chat. I mean, they've been with us the whole time, and it's been a lot of fun. So I want to thank you guys again. I'll give you guys the mic to uh, as final words. Uh, just um, yeah. I, I, only final words go I have ahead, is I want to thank Derek for being here and debating me. Uh, he's actually a pretty nice fella. Uh, adamant in what he believes. He's staunch. He, he <laughs> believes it. But uh, but he's been pretty cordial, and we were able to have a good discussion without you know getting rude with each other. And, and that was great. I really appreciate that, Derek. Thank, Thank you. you. You know, I know at, at times it got a little heated, but I definitely appreciate well, it. Well, that's going to happen, right? But, you right. know, you kept it really, uh, you know, red, really cordial, and I appreciate that. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I, I, I respect you as, as, as a person, and I definitely appreciate your knowledge. Uh, and so just my hat's off to you, sir, and uh, standing for truth, always, always respect. And, uh, you, know, you know, I just appreciate talking to you guys and hearing new ideas and, and, and discovering new things and, and and you know, seeing new areas where I need to look at, uh, look into, you know, so so definitely. And I'm always open to new information, new ideas. Uh, I, I'm of course going to defend my position, but I'm gonna go back to the books and make sure that what I'm saying is, is true and right. And you know, if I see something that's uh, like I said, I go with the evidence, whatever the evidence is, that's what I'm going with. And uh, it, oh, it's saying it for true, I don't know how long I could, but I would, I wouldn't mind doing that after show. If you could just email me that link, I would uh, click in and uh. See Absolutely. Yeah, I'll um yes, that's a good idea. I'll I'll just email it to you. So then it'll be uh um that's, that's probably the easiest way. So amen. Great words, great final words, gentlemen, and I appreciate you both exactly. There's no reason why we can't disagree, but also come together and have a good cordial discussion and debate like this was. And every debate gets a little bit heated and, and passionate at times, but this is the best way to end it, you know, mutual respect. So thank uh thank you to both of you guys. You made this a lot of fun. We'll head over to the after show night. What's what's nice is I guess it's daylight savings time. So we gain 
in an hour, so it's going to be a wild night. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. You know, I'm up for it. I got some great coffee to drink. Yeah, I just, <laughs> I just finished my coffee, so this is good. Another all-nighter. Okay, guys, so this was great. Once again, I am going to Thanks. shut her down. And once again, awesome debate. I really enjoyed it. One of the best. So Thank anyways, everybody, so staying for truth is out. God bless. Thank you.